Greetings, everyone attending this seminar, uh, seminar, webinar, breakout session, a variety of different modalities to get at a very, very important issue. The role of GIS when a jurisdiction is experiencing a cyber attack. Uh, and more broadly, the expanding role of GIS professional scientists, practitioners, and their supporters and colleagues in emergency management and public safety in developing uh, a new order of, of participation and inclusion in the complicated management of crises uh, field. Uh, my name is Clark Kimmerer. I am a facilitator for the Center for Homeland Defense and Security at the Naval Postgraduate School in Monterey, California. Uh, we call our program the nation's Homeland Security Educator. It's been around since the aftermath of 9-11. And our mission is to provide executive level educational opportunities on homeland security and disaster management uh, challenges in this change today. Uh, and, and to that end, we conduct these kind of, of educational programs. They're intended to be interactive, they're intended to be inclusive, and we typically are going to present questions and hear from subject matter experts uh, from our center uh, that don't necessarily have answers. Um, I, I liken our process to some extent to uh, taking a calculus test. You may know what the, the questions are, that doesn't mean you're gonna be able to answer them, or at least not fully. But again, to that end, we take the, the approach of, of being highly uh, uh, participative, collegial, collaborative, respectful. Uh, we're all uh, trying to, to deal with the challenges of this day to the best of our ability. Why don't we go to the panel? Well, good afternoon. I'll start. I'm Cheryl good. Engel. I am the Cyber I Program Manager at Ohio Homeland Security. Great. Thank you, Cheryl. But we're going to uh, going to introduce you as you come into the the program. Uh, so uh, I've got uh, uh, a whole lot of folks here, and uh, what I want to do is is introduce our subject matter expert panel, and uh, then my colleagues on the board of the National Alliance for Public Safety GIS Foundation. Uh, they too will be participating in this examination, uh, as are uh, like Cheryl. Uh, our core participants from various places with, within the GIS and emergency management community, some from academia. Uh, my goal was to bring together about 20 of the participants here today to really help uh, us ferret out the, the things that we need to do to strengthen our capacity and capability to address cyber attacks and, and GIS challenges generally. So uh, I'd like to uh, start by uh, introducing uh, my subject matter expert panel from the center. Uh, I'd like to start with uh, Eileen Decker. Uh, Eileen was, hello Eileen, Eileen's uh, uh, waving her hand. Uh, Eileen has a very, very uh, estimable career. She was the U.S. Attorney for Central California, appointed under the Obama administration, then became the Deputy Mayor of that little quaint village by the sea, Los Angeles, where she uh, focused upon homeland security and public safety issues. Uh, she is currently the uh, president, uh, the chair of the, the Police Accountability Commission in Los Angeles, the Police Commission, uh, and is also uh, an instructor and has done a lot of research for the center and for the rest of humanity on ransomware exploits. So she'll be talking about that today. Next, I'd like to introduce uh, my, uh, my, all of these are my good friends, but uh, uh, the, the friend of my longest standing, uh, Bob Steffen. Bob has been a uh, subject matter expert for the center for many, many years. In fact, we probably came on about the same time together, almost maybe 14 years ago. Uh, Bob has uh, a military career. He was a colonel in the Air Force. Uh, after that, he uh, joined DHS as assistant, I believe, undersecretary for infrastructure, uh, infrastructure protection. He really uh, was instrumental in designing a lot of what I call the Ministry of Homeland Defense back in the in the in DC and uh, across the country uh, was uh, instrumental in developing the first NIMS and and other protocols. Uh, also the alert system, which he I don't think he likes to take any credit for. Uh, but uh, Bob currently uh, works uh, in uh, Griffin Scientific uh, on a lot of of uh, uh, hard to pronounce projects uh, around <laughs> homeland security and. And, uh, and, and our defense of our country. 
And uh, finally, last but not least, uh, one of my other running buddies, Jim Featherstone. Uh, Jim had a, a long career in uh, the uh, LA Fire Department. Uh, from uh, there, he was, uh, uh, as he tells me, voluntold uh, to become the general manager of the Los Angeles Department of Emergency Management. Somewhere along that way, he was also the interim fire chief. Uh, he went from there upon retirement to uh, the Homeland Security Advisory Council, and currently he's established his own uh, think tank uh, called Thamata Strategic. Um, and after the break uh, or at some later time, he can explain to you what the word Thamata uh, means. Also very, very pleased to, to uh, welcome my colleagues on the board of directors. Uh, so that's another kind of one of my, my uh, passions. Uh, uh, Rand Napoli uh, has like me, been on the board for many, many years. In fact, we probably were original board members, uh, I don't know, 14 years ago, something like that. Uh, he was a fire marshal for the state of Florida. Uh, he will be participating in uh, both our dialogues and uh, in the breakout sessions. Uh, Chris Diller is currently the chair of the, uh, the NAPSIG board. Uh, he's with the uh, Department of uh, Wisconsin Department of uh, Military Affairs uh, and uh, very passionate, uh, like we all are, about GIS and uh, its role and value uh, in all aspects of keeping our nation safe and responding from, from disaster. And finally, uh, Justin Cates is the uh, emergency manager for Nashua, New Hampshire. He's the treasurer of the NAPSIG board. And we've done uh, actually a cybersecurity uh, seminar for Nashua just before uh, the trouble started um, on March 12th. So, uh, with that, uh, we are going to launch into this session, and it will consist of a number of different parts. Uh, the very first thing we're going to do uh, is uh, we're going to um, give you an opening question. So uh, both our core group of participants and our subject matter experts uh, will be addressing uh, the, the questions about kind of where we're going to go from here. What are the things that are, are uh, most significant? In, in terms of our risk vectors. Uh, so that's our question uh, that we're going to launch into. Uh, and uh, from there, we're going to have what I'm going to call a tutorial on cyber attacks with our three SMEs and uh, give some baseline information about what we know uh, about the nature of cyber attacks as they exist today, uh, the varieties of them, uh, our risk vectors, and, and probably also some of the things that might represent uh, countermeasures and, uh, and other ways to mitigate or otherwise manage uh, these devastating types of attacks. Always with a view to asking the question, where does GIS fit into this equation? Uh, I know, we know that GIS uh, uh, per, you know, per, uh, uh, systems, uh, the, the, passionate and scientists, the passionate scientists and practitioners who, who people those systems, uh, are, I would venture to say, underutilized. They are absolutely vital and their current uh, uh, contributions are estimable. But I always uh, thought that we were underusing uh, the GIS specialists when I was in the emergency management world. Uh, I actually should have probably told you, uh, I, I was so humbled by my SMEs and board of directors uh, CVs that I, I, I didn't want to talk about myself much, but I, my career was with the Seattle Police Department. I was second in command for about 16 years as chief of staff and chief of operations. But I also, and this is the only interesting part really, uh, I had collateral duties as the director of the Emergency Operations Center. And that was for the city, not just the police department. So during activations, I was uh, the, the manager as it were uh, of the EOC. And I always had my GIS folks uh, at the table, the planning table, particularly in the areas of recovery. Um, and, and not with a view to the role that we seem to be doing more than we should, uh, which is, here's, a, here's a, a, a challenge, but go bring me a map. I actually want to have a much more expanded role uh, to, uh, to our GIS partners. So uh, let's just talk about this question, uh, you know, broadly. This is kind of our, our way to, you know, get get people talking, uh, get the throats cleared. Let's go back to the panel. So uh, thinking about risk, what, what are the risks uh, in terms of, of cyber uh, breaches to GIS in particular? Um, how do you size those up? I mean, how are we, how are we thinking about uh, the risk vectors that could involve 
uh, the ability of GIS uh, uh, professionals to, to do their job, to support jurisdictions as they're attempting to confront a disaster. Let me start with some of my, my SME colleagues, uh, you know, Jim or Bob or Eileen. I mean, how are you looking at the landscape here, just broadly about cyber? Eileen, do you want to start off? You're muted, or Bob. Hey, thanks, Clark. Uh, great to be with you guys today from uh, sunny Virginia here on the Eastern Standard Time, one o'clock. Hey, uh, for me, Clark, to put it up, put it very simply, for me, cyber risk is what I call nanosecond risk. That means from one day to the or one minute to the next, you're living in a very comfortable, plugged in 21st century information environment. And the nanosecond later, that can all be taken away from you very quickly. And if you're associated with government uh, essential services or information sharing or provide or perform any type of public safety role, to have those uh, cyber eyes and ears cut out away from you uh, is a very disturbing phenomenon. That's uh, something that this type of um, threat vector represents to the United States more so than any other threat vector that we've, we've actually faced. And it's a threat vector that, that can reach into to everyone's home across America, again, in a nanosecond, depending on the kind of actor we're talking about. So I don't think the US and its government um, systems and its government functionality, its private sector functionality has ever faced this type of, of risk or specifically this array of threat actors that's after us at different levels. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. Great, yeah. Eileen, your thoughts? Sure, and I would just add to what, what Bob said, obviously agree with everything he said, but to add uh, one of my deepest concerns is what we don't know. Right? What we don't know about how we're connected, how everybody is connected, how if one city is attacked, it could impact other cities, other counties, and uh, our interconnectivity, the internet of things in a way, but the internet of our connectivity and what we don't know, going back to pencil and paper, is not, um, it's something we have to practice. It's not something that's necessarily practical. It's not what the public expects of us. Uh, but the fundamental core is we all don't know how interconnected we are and the cascading impact of any one of these attacks can happen. We stress uh, in our programs the, the value, and, and, and Bob is a particular uh, advocate of this, of understanding interdependencies, of understanding that if one thing happens here, there could be cascading effects that implicate uh, other systems, but, you know, in, in our kind of uh, global uh, uh, world here could impact other jurisdictions. Um, uh, Jim, anything you want to add? So certainly, you know, agree with uh, what Bob and Eileen have offered. Uh, from my perspective, I, I, I look at the, the consequence management. And I think Eileen nailed it when she talked about the cascading impact. Uh, in the conversation with Craig Fugate several years ago, we brought up the uh, issue of cyber and he said, Look, look at your major power outages. That's a lot what the cyber attack will look like. He says, now he says sure, there are different you know, uh, attacks you know, the, the, from the ones and zeros perspective, but the, the consequences of a cyber event and what the disruption of city services are or, or municipal services or, or corporate uh, capabilities are, are huge. I mean, we, we're so dependent these days on ones and zeros and electrons. And a cyber attack, whatever the crisis is, whether it's intentional or, or accidental, um, like going back to what Eileen said, the cascading impact or the cascading effect, uh, we, much like public health, we have no idea uh, how, what, what it'll be. Look at Texas. You know, Texas could have very well been a cyber event. The triggering uh, issue didn't necessarily have to be uh, adverse weather. It could have been a cyber uh, crisis. It would cause a very similar uh, debilitation or, uh, of, of services and capability. What about some of my board uh, colleagues, uh, Rand or, or Justin uh, or Chris? Uh, what are your thoughts about you know, the world we're facing right now, uh, particularly as, as concerns the role of GIS? Rand? Well, I, I certainly agree with what's just been said. Um, and, and from the national perspective, that's really critical as it relates to you know, the electric grid and all those kinds of things. But when you bring it back down uh, to either state level or local level, those interconnectivity uh, points that we have 
uh, that Eileen first mentioned, as, as did Bob and Jim, uh, we're, we're tied together now in ways we never were before, even the simplest as down to our CAD system, you know, computer dispatch systems for fire, law enforcement, EMS. Uh, they rely, those CAD systems rely on a lot of third party software and a lot of third party um, uh, operations that are going on outside their own walls. So um, if, for instance, uh, as we all know, many uh, jurisdictions, their GIS capabilities don't come from within, for instance, the city or county government, perhaps. It comes from the local utility, uh, maybe the electric utility who's had the money to build that GIS capability, and they've started to share that GIS capability uh, with the jurisdictions, uh, again, through whether it's CAD system or the GIS feeding the CAD system. So all those interconnectivities, I don't think we've thought enough about that, uh, that if, if the electric uh, utility or the water utility goes down, is their GIS system that the, the fire or EMS or law enforcement are also depending on, does that go down at the same time? So those are the things I think about is the interconnectivities that we don't think about uh, uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, but probably should. Yeah. You know, this is going to be a very important part of, of our conversation today, what you just teed up, because there's, there's one argument, I suppose, uh, that, that has some strength is, you know, a city can go down, as it were, their data could be encrypted, stolen, uh, manipulated, uh, tainted, corrupted, uh, but that GIS can still function at some level. I mean, we could go into, you know, just a kind of a satellite access, you know, outside of, of city systems. But on the other hand, uh, what, what can GIS provide us if the information that we need to have uh, the analytics applied to is no longer available? All the things that you're talking about, you know, all the, the CAD, the deployments, the the just basic information, you know, what's what's the geography that's contained in licensing and permits and things like that, that's no longer available. Then doesn't that make even uh, GIS brought in from outside, you know, accessing, you know, the the the, the kind of the the uh, the atmosphere, as it were, what's its utility going to be? I, I think you're saying pretty problematic. Um, so, uh, Justin, you we did a cyber event in, in Nashua. I don't know if you, you're still getting any sleep after that, uh, but uh, I'd, I'd be interested in your thoughts about, you know, just broadly the, the risk picture and uh, what we need to be thinking about, you know, in terms of GIS integration. Sure. So when you came and facilitated the exercise for us in Nashua, I think one of the key uh, things that our GIS team identified after going through that was uh, the, the foundational level data that they are responsible for and any sort of attack or, or loss of that data uh, could really present some significant challenges to some of our city departments that rely heavily on it. We put a lot of protections um, on other uh, critical data within the city, whether it be financial data for our community um, or information about uh, you know, patient records for our public health department. Uh, but think of all the geospatial related data that uh, might be uh, the responsibility of a very small team that may not have the, the bandwidth to think about cybersecurity as a core set of their, their functions. So certainly concerning from a local government perspective. Yeah. Chris, anything? Uh, yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, if you don't mind, I'm, I think I'm going to share a screen um, with one slide. I don't know if you guys can see this or not. Um, and this is... Great, I'm glad you can see it. So this, this kind of alludes, this slide or this one little screenshot alludes to the second question that you had uh, proposed, Clark, which is where does GIS fit in cybersecurity? Um, and so I put this slide deck or this particular slide together uh, a while back, but I'm in a little unique position. Um, I'm the GIS administrator for my agency, but reality is we're a core of uh, eight people in IT and we all are on the same team and we're all in cybersecurity. And so as a GIS administrator, I'm also the server and storage administrator, but we have uh, daily discussions about securing our environment. And so having a better understanding of, you know, GIS within cybersecurity um, you know, you have to have that strategy at the top level, but then it comes down to the practitioners and those at the tactical level of implementing it. But I think we have to look at this, you know, from a strategic perspective of 
is your data really subject to, to you know, to the rigors of uh, cybersecurity measures? And the answer is yes. So this little triangle off to the right is a, a typical triangle that we use in information technology, which is called CIA, confidentiality, integrity, and availability. This is the, the three-legged stool around cybersecurity. So your data may be public data, and it may be out there freely available to download. Uh, but if somebody is downloading that data and they can't trust the data, then you've lost integrity on sharing that information. So integrity is a very important uh, component to this. Now, confidentiality certainly is important. Um, and that is the level of access to the data. Not all data is public. Some data might be available uh, you know, for official use only. And some of it might even be, especially on the defense side, um, be at the secret level. And there's all varying levels of access that are important. So that's the confidentiality piece. And then the last component, the third leg, is availability. Well, even if you, let's say your data, whether it's public or, or, or fit for official use only, uh, and you can, you can ensure integrity, but you can't make it available when you need it to, that becomes problematic. And I sort of, uh, you know, lends uh, to the thing you were talking about, Clark, and that is, uh, if you can't get to the data, how are you going to work on, uh, how are you going to do GIS and, and do things uh, down the road? So whether you're, you're using this data, as I said, for legal matters or next generation 911 uh, elections, utility mapping, critical infrastructure, so on and so forth, um, we all have a role to play in cybersecurity, all of us, whether at management level or at the tactical level, uh, those who are making maps on a daily basis. That's our responsibility. Uh, so if you're not familiar with this CIA triangle, um, you know, this is something to get, uh, you know, to get familiar with and understand how you fit within this sort of three-legged stool. Hopefully that was helpful for you, Clark. And Oh my gosh, yeah, it was great. Thank you, Chris. And, and uh, you know, you've now, you've now kind of set up uh, really some of the, the key elements we're going to try and get to in this uh, seminar. Um, I, I want to uh, get to some of our core participants. Before I do that, I'd like to... Uh, like to show you one more slide to get some uh, baseline kind of, kind of thinking here. Uh, by the way, all the all the things that we're we're sharing with you are going to be available to you. So uh, I, I imagine Chris is more than happy to share that wonderful uh, uh, graphic that he just put up and, and walked us through. Uh, this is uh, one of many kind of ways to depict how to analyze risk. Uh, it's the one that we tend to use because it's kind of convenient and, and we already have the slide made. Uh, at the center. Uh, so the, the risk assessment model we use, uh, you know, there's many like Thyra's, uh, is pretty straightforward. You threat, vulnerability, and consequences. So risk is, you know, the product of the level of threat, level of your vulnerability, which also translates into capabilities. And, uh, and just as uh, a number of our, our folks said, Jim and, and uh, Rand echoed it, uh, the consequences of uh, a successful attack uh, and so I just want to commend you to that uh, notion because we're going to be talking through it a lot, uh, and and uh, so that's our, that's our graphic. Uh, before we continue our conversation for the next ten minutes or so, uh, I'd like to put up a quick instant poll uh, that uh, enables us to get some uh, feelings from the the larger group uh, about your view of their risks uh, that you're, you're confronting. Um, so please uh, take a look at that. It's a little bit wordy. Uh, but, uh, you know, if you could uh, uh, log your, your, uh, your responses, and you could, you could choose as many as you'd like. I mean, we'll take an aggregated number. Um, and who knows, it may be all of these. But, but what are the greatest of these? What are the ones that really keep you up at night? And uh, we'll take a look at the, at the uh, responses here in, in a minute or two. Um, among our, our uh, core participants, any thoughts on this question? Uh, Daniel, Cheryl, anybody that wants to jump in on this? Yeah, so uh, to talk a little bit about some of the stuff from our angle, um, with our GIS systems, I, I talked yesterday in my uh, innovation talk about you know, how we have a statewide fire evacuation layer. Um, so if you have a local jurisdiction that is impacted by a cyber attack, their ability to go in and edit information that, that's used for public information, 
as well as sharing out with our partners that information becomes a risk. I mean, we mentioned earlier about the trust factor being a key component. Um, cyber is not necessarily an unknown event for us. We actually had a cyber attack that happened in Tillamook County last year that uh, ended up uh, forcing a $300,000 ransom uh, paid to regain access to their data and systems. So it did not necessarily in fact, uh, impact state systems per se, but it did impact a local jurisdiction and did impact their capability to make requests for state assistance to provide support for them. So keeping that sort of stuff in mind that, yeah, it may not affect you as a state. And granted, I'm, I'm talking a lot about the state level because that's where my box is. Right. Um, right. But, you know, it may not impact us at the state level, but impacts to the local level do affect the state level. And especially as you build those relationships between your local partners, um, whether it's sharing of information, usage of uh, critical applications. So the quick little poll that you guys push out there, I actually checked all the boxes there because yeah, sure. it does. It, <laughs> it, well, it impacts everything. And, yeah. and on the back end for us, you know, we don't use WebEOC, we use OpCenter. OpCenter is a SQL database, right? We have that tied in with GIS on the back end. So the compromise of any sort of these interconnected systems impacts other systems as well. Right. And the right. reliability of that information becomes compromised. And if you start getting to a situation where GIS is impacted, that's affecting your main system for making requests for state assistance and resources, that impacts the response to that particular event. So it's, not, it's, it's kind of that compounding of those issues one after the other. So uh, I don't know, do we have our poll back? Uh... Uh, Charlotte? Yes. Okay, great, thank you. Looks to me like, well, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm not very clever at this stuff. And so when I wrote out the various risks that leapt out at me in, in our research, uh, I fully expected that it would be like all of them. But it's, it's interesting, the overload uh, issue. Uh, which, you know, takes various forms that Bob's going to talk about in, in a few minutes. Um, you know, that's distributed denial of service is one of those kind of, of, uh, of approaches. Uh, and, 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 and again, it, it, it's an interesting uh, thing because it's probably the most blunt instrument, right? I mean, ransomware, you know, and, and Eileen's going to talk about this. Certainly SCADA system attacks uh, are, are, they can be, require some level of sophistication, but I would think you know this this most uh, uh, answered risk vector is something that, like the, the scary scenario suggests to us, you know the the teenager in the Crimea Crimea could probably execute pretty well. Uh, I think in looking at, at uh, second place here, uh, the lack of access to reliable jurisdictional data. That's what we have been talking about. I think uh, you know Chris's slide about you know uh, you know kind of integration, reliability, that availability, that sort of thing kind of speaks to that. That yes, we can do all kinds of things with GIS, even if a place is ultimately dark, does not mean GIS is turned off. We have to find other ways to access it. But what are we accessing it to do? Uh, you gotta have the data of the, from the jurisdiction in order to answer the questions uh, and participate in the analytics. I think that's fairly fair to say. Uh, some other interesting one, incident management systems. Um, uh, I, we're going to talk about that too. I think that's one of the big frontiers here. And uh, a lot of really progressive places are, are uh, using GIS as part of the overall incident management uh, process. Uh, but I also think GIS has a great deal to offer the incident managers themselves, the, the incident commanders, in terms of decisions being made both in the field and at that more global level in an emergency operations center, emergency coordination center. Um, that's interesting. We're gonna keep coming back to this. Uh, I wanna just get a couple more comments uh, and then we're gonna kind of launch into our tutorial section. We also have a video to play for you. Uh, any other thoughts on risk? Uh, and uh, as, particularly as it concerns GIS systems and their, their integration and integrity uh, uh, in terms of, of helping uh, disasters. Uh, uh, Peter or? Uh... Yeah, um, I was actually working in Baltimore when Baltimore got hit with uh, ransomware and 
it basically took us back to the stone age or when I was a rookie and we didn't have any computers, uh, everything was back to paper and pencil or pen. And um, there really was no GIS because nobody knew what computers were touched by the ransomware. Um, if you had your computer in your office and you didn't have a laptop that could be taken off the, the network and you didn't have a secondary uh, data source, that stuff was all locked down until it was verified that it was uh, clean to use. So um, it, it, it just it just locks everything down. It's 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 horrible. Like uh, I, if you don't have a continuity plan in place for uh, cyber terrorism and, and ransomware attacks, uh, it's de definitely something you need to be thinking about. Yes. Yeah. Uh, well, I know we're going to be diving into that, particularly in those breakout groups, because we're going to be seeking ideas. Uh, and it seems to me there's a three-letter word that uh, once once compromised uh, can poison everything, and that is web. If it's on the web, uh, guess what? You're, you're going to confront what you did in, in, saw in Baltimore. You know, a total unreliability, getting back to Chris's point, the, the lack of trustworthiness uh, of your of your systems, uh, and Eileen has done a lot of study of, of these uh, scenarios. I'm going to go back to Baltimore as well in her presentation. Um, Cheryl, any thoughts? Uh, you can actually have the last word here. Well, I've been in IT for over 25 years, and so I look at it from that type sort of um, the, through that lens. And definitely all the backups that you need to do of all your data, anything that we can use to restore as close to the date of when the attack happens. Um, it's just trying to get everyone to do that, make sure they got all their patching and stuff done, all those different maintenance schedules. I look at it from that view of it. Yeah, I, I, that's, that's so important. And uh, you know, we've been talking about that redundant systems backups uh, for many, many, many years. And I'd say, we're still struggling with that. I'd say many places are, are top of the order on, on these issues. Uh, I, I think like uh, Peter said, Baltimore found themselves um, in, in a bad place. And, and you know, you've gotta be making the investments all along and that means there's gotta be money to invest. Uh, and in places, you know, that, that are, have so many other problems and challenges, those are tough decisions to make. That's why our program, I think, is important because we're trying to speak to decision makers, ultimately, about what the, the prioritization process could look like. All right, we're going to pivot now. This, thank you very much, by the way. And, and uh, I want to share with you a video. We've got three videos that are going to kind of tee up uh, our challenges here. This one is, they have, all three are from Nashua, so Justin has already seen them. Nashua's municipal IT systems are believed to be under a potentially serious cyber attack called testing. But Nashua is not alone. In the past 48 hours, small and medium-sized cities across the country have come under similar attacks of their city and regional IT systems. We go to Nancy Yamada now for an update. Nancy. Gary, City of Nashua officials have confirmed a significant increase in the average number of daily password hacking attempts Right now, the city's critical data control and communication systems have been severely taxed by the demands of severe weather and periodic power outages. And officials believe this may be the reason for the attack. As of now, Nashua has not seen the so-called brute force hacking attempts that other cities have seen, attacks into government and private sector IT systems. Baltimore City, which is still recovering from its May 7th cyber attack, is reported to be seeing brute force attempts into its IT network, prompting concerns that another Robin Hood ransomware attack is being attempted. So uh, that's just kind of a table setting sort of, of uh, scenario. There's going to be a couple more turns to it. Right now, what we're seeing is the kind of what we obviously can surmise is the beginning of uh, a campaign to to introduce malware and to take over systems and, and all those bad things. But why don't we, I'd like to spend, you know, next probably 25 to 30 minutes or more or so um, talking about those bad things, uh, getting everyone baselined on kind of the state of the world uh, as concerns the various types of cyber attacks, what are our vulnerabilities. Uh, so uh, we're gonna have Bob kind of give us the broad overview uh, up until the point we talk about ransomware, we, we bring our, our uh, 
our master of ransomware uh, scholarship, uh, Eileen Decker, into the conversation. And then Jim is going to close it out just by talking about the emergency management world generally uh, in, in looking at, you know, ultimately the integration of GIS into that world, uh, particularly as concerned cyber attacks. So, Bob, the floor is yours. Hey, Clark, thanks a lot. And if we can go to the first slide in the, the thread deck, that would be great. And just um, kind of a, as a stage setter here, it looks to me like we have about 108, 109 folks on the call. And the, in, the intention um, of what we're going to, the three of us are going to walk you through is to kind of go through a very quick once over the world of cyber risk. And we're going to talk about different threat vectors and actors, uh, the vulnerabilities associated with, with IT and OT systems, as well as those interconnected cascading consequences that could be uh, essentially set in motion by a successful cyber attack. Um, we're going to go to the next slide, please. And again, uh, this is just a broad brush overview. If you are not currently a cybersecurity expert, these next three mini presentations will not make you a cybersecurity expert. Uh, what we're trying to do here is uh, a set a, best, a baseline to the best of our ability and kind of make sure that we can engage as many folks in a thoughtful discussion as we can, uh, both as we return to plenary after this session and then in the individual breakout groups. So when we're talking about cyber threats or cybersecurity, we're really focused on three things with respect to GIS and, and really other things, information, information systems, and information technology and operational technology systems that are connected to the internet. And hence, because of that interconnection to the internet, uh, have a vulnerability that could be exploited by any number of actors. Um, the second bullet there says that the nature of cyber threats is really involves a cast of characters, an assortment of different shapes and sizes, anything from a simple high school hacker to very complex, very well-coordinated and very well-funded nation state attacks that are kind of labeled with the moniker of advanced persistent threats or APTs. Uh, the response, the mitigation pieces, all are a reflection of who's attacking you and why. And we'll get into that in the next uh, several slides. So if I could have the next one, please. First category of threats that we kind of want to bring to the table are just simple and unstructured threats. Little sophistication, very simple to execute, targets of opportunity, not necessarily a, a, a specifically focused target. Um, motivations vary from simple bragging rights to thrills, uh, taking a, a cyber joyride, if you will, revenge, uh, uh, a simpler uh, variants of, of malware attacks and, and ransomware attacks that you, you see on the news all the time. Um, also easy to spot, easy to detect, and easy to thwart. A major cause uh, for, for entry or, or for success on the attacker's part is simple, simply very poor cyber hygiene uh, down to the individual level. Next slide, please. Now we bring it kind of up a notch beyond those simple threats. Now we have a category of threats, what I refer to as advanced structured threats, much more organized, require some detailed level of planning and funding specific targets um, as opposed to just random um, extortion like the Nigerian uh, hacker guys do, and extensive reconnaissance and embedding uh, serotypously into a system to gather information to aid and abet a follow-on attack. Use of a variety of combination of potential cyber hacker threat vectors as, as you see in the third bullet there. And uh, the most successful of these kind of threats are also rely on insider knowledge of the systems and the business operations uh, where the target is or that, that comprise the target. Uh, some examples of this type of uh, advanced structured threat would be organized crime, Russian ma uh, mafia folks, those kind of people. Next slide, please. This is the most dangerous threat of all, complex coordinated threats or what we call national security threats. And these are really motivated by very significant, uh, significantly funded and well-trained and well-organized criminal organization but even more importantly, nation state threats uh, that could be uh, nation state actors or perhaps uh, terrorist organizations aided and abetted in some way by, by uh, nation state actors. Extensive organization, very deep funding, very extensive planning over an extended time frame, kind of like the, uh, the cyber variant of the Norby invasion and the planning sequence that had to precede it. And the goal is that much more than to have a very uh, limited, direct effect on the, the system that's the initial uh, kind of target of entry 
but to have a significant set of objectives well beyond that initial point of entry. These things are becoming increasingly difficult to uh, detect as we saw with solar winds uh, last year in 2020. Uh, those guys are in the system for 10 months or more before they were detected by FireEye. Uh, the supply chain piece is becoming ever critical and to you folks in the GIS community, significant attention needs to be applied to this threat vector because somewhere between research and development, uh, the distribution of parts and components, the installation of parts and components, their life cycle maintenance, there's a zillion opportunities for entry and manipulation on the part of malicious actors across that life cycle. And the stuff that you guys rely on to do your job and provide your functionality is increasingly becoming a victim of, of uh, supply chain issues across the board, both on the vendor side, uh, as well as on the end user side. Uh, these things can involve multiple attack vectors all at, all at once with significant potential insider help, a lot of coordination from multiple across multiple groups, and a lot of uh, covert presence in advance on sensitive networks as we saw in the solar winds hack. Next, please. This kind of sums up the current threat environment as simply as I can put it. Uh, malicious cyber activity exists e everywhere and across all walks of life, across all levels of government, the private sector, research and development guys and gals and academia. These things are growing more and more sophisticated, more and more targeted and having more and more um, cascading disruption across our economy, society and potentially systems of government. Uh, the nature and sources of the threats are diverse as we've just seen. And these nation state perpetrated acts are on the rise. Very difficult to attribute, um, but the capabilities that we see in some of these things mean it has to be somebody that's very smart and can buy the best and, and brightest talent in the world. The attack objectives specifically really depend on the motivations and, uh, and the objectives of the individual attackers. And why this is becoming so prevalent, just a couple of key factors here, a very dynamic business environment, just in time delivery of stuff, uh, insurance and, and integrity of the supply chain from a cradle to grave perspective, and just uh, individual level to enterprise level, whether they're talking about government or private sector, and sector, very poor basic cyber hygiene. Next slide, please. Attack trends are increasingly sophisticated, um, and more and more so every day. The attacks, the attackers seem to be favored. The offense seems to be favored over the defense. Uh, the offense takes uh, seemingly less amounts of time to perpetrate greater impactful attacks, and the defense has a more significant task in front of it in order to kind of anticipate what the next thing might be and how to get in front of it in advance. And when you do get hit with something, it's not as simple as it used to be as just, well, let's just patch that system and we'll be back up and running in about six to eight hours. Uh, that is no longer the paradigm of the day uh, because of in, the increasing sophistication of the attackers and the extent of the interconnected things that they're attacking. Next, please. Uh, this is a very uh, critical thing to, to your all's world. And it's a thing that uh, really keeps me up at night is com very complex critical infrastructure mapping of United States private sector and public sector infrastructure assets and systems down to the county level uh, and city level across our country. Uh, this is done through, in some cases, it's secret information that becomes available to our adversaries, but the majority of this is done through simple open source mining of data that's available on the internet about our critical infrastructure sectors, individual assets and systems, industrial control system components, so on and so forth, aided and abetted by insider knowledge of folks that have affiliations with our various adversary inside our country, inside industries, inside companies. And some of them were even training in our own technical colleges and universities and, and other things around the country. So that, that's an interesting twist. Um, I wanna say that based upon what I've seen at the unclassified level, there's not a state or a territory that hasn't been affected by this uh, infrastructure mapping on the part of various types of adversaries, including nation states, organized criminal gangs, and, uh, and uh, essentially cybersecurity mercenaries. And you can see uh, from just take a scan, a Google scan of newspaper headlines over the past year or two, all of these sectors that are, that are delineated on the bottom part of the slide there have uh, suffered some type of attack that can be traced to a combination of very smart cyber hackers, as well as a knowledge 
and a mapping of our cyber system or our cyber and physical systems and the interconnections between them. Next, please. Yeah, I guess on that previous slide, I would say you're in one of three categories right now. If you're an infrastructure system or asset, you've either been mapped, you're in the process of being mapped, or you're on the list to be mapped by somebody. And that's a pretty scary thing. Um, deny, uh, distributed denial of service attacks, affectionately known as DDoS attacks. This is simply something that occurs, uh, could be perpetrated by, by a simple actor all the way to a complex actor, or as part of a complex actor's multiple toolkit that'll throw at you uh, simultaneously. This happens when servers and networks are flooded with a very excessive amount of traffic that simply overwhelms the website or server that's the target of the attack with so many uh, requests that the, the system, for lack of a, a better way to explain it, simply explodes. It becomes inoperable and ceases to function until the attack is countered. The good news about this type of attack is it normally is a very short duration. It can normally be fixed uh, fairly quickly uh, with simple uh, cyber remediation techniques and patching. Uh, it could involve a sophisticated use of uh, what we call botnets or computers that have been actually taken over by a, a master computer, which, which pushes the signals out to overload another, another target, or simply uh, functioning systems that are hoodwinked or tricked into following the orders of the master system that's directing the attack. Um, along with DDoS attacks using that type of tactic, technique, and procedure, a lot of social engineering, uh, credential harvesting and sealing, uh, stealing, and physical attacks on systems to allow that penetration or to kind of open the hole in the cyber fence for them to get in. Uh, next slide, please. Just a brief vignette on the solar winds hack of that happened sometime in early uh, 2020 till it was discovered in around December timeframe of uh, of 2020. Very masterfully orchestrated supply chain exploit. Uh, Again, in our systems, unknown to the government or private sector systems that were affected till about 10 months into it, discovered by a cybersecurity firm called FireEye in December of last year. Uh, the discovery was sparked by uh, a kind of this weird convergence of a ton of data of unknown origin uh, going to a server of known origin. Unfortunately, that server was basically uh, responsible for controlling updates and patches for the SolarWinds Orion uh, function which then allowed the attackers to inject malicious code into software updates across the public and private sectors inside our country and elsewhere, and allowed data modification, data exfiltration, the extent of which is still unknown. But um, as has been said in the press, this, this was most likely going to go down to the books as the most significant national security cyber threat uh, and successful attack that we've ever faced. And it's been attributed um, most likely to an advanced a persistent threat actor that speaks Russian, but I won't name the country. Next, please. Industrial control systems or ICS systems. This is kind of an aggregate term that's used to describe a lot of different types of devices, systems and controls that basically allow a, a computer system or some type of industrial process or functionality uh, to be governed via the internet for, for ease and, and efficiency purposes. Uh, within ICS, we have a term called SCADA, Supervisory Data Control and Acquisition Systems. These are systems that collect information in a, in a field array of, of networks. They send it to a central computer system or a facility, which displays it graphically, graphically or textually, and that allows a, a remote monitoring and control function so that you don't have to have people on a site 24 seven uh, to do those same monitoring and control functions. This can all be done via the internet. That all works well in a, in a world where there are no malicious cyber entities that are trying to exploit uh, such a convenience or such an efficiency, but there are. And in fact, these industrial control systems and SCADA system contains, depending on which one we're talking about, tons of different control loops, human interfaces, where that poor cyber hygiene piece factors in and remote diagnostic tools that allow that remote access and ban is an incredible front door uh, to some of our most sensitive systems. Uh, the last bullet identifies some of the industries or aspects of our economy uh, where these systems are prevalent. Next, please. So this, uh, this is not an imaginary threat. Um, we see that 
uh, increasing attacks um, and reporting from utility companies to include chemical plants, water systems, manufacturers, and distributors around the world that use this. Um, the bad guys are enabled by the fact that there are like six ICS vendors, as it says on the slide, that are used in about 75% of the domestic uh, ICS uh, systems that, that are employed across U.S. industries. That commonality in systems suggests that the attacker only has to learn six things and then learn how to exploit them. It's not like it's a very dynamic uh, and, and controlled environment from, the, from the, the perspective of the defense. It's very lucrative in terms of this. Some of these systems are made overseas. The United States government has no control nor industry has any control over uh, what's going into their, into their composition and the processes and access to the processes that would allow or not allow things to be embedded um, into those ICS uh, components as they're being manufactured abroad. Um, popular target vectors um, by bad actors that like to use this way to, uh, to make our lives very, very complex. Remote access monitoring systems, again, and removable data, and that's generally connected to an insider threat of some sort. And then increasingly, uh, we see supply chain vulnerabilities from cradle to grave uh, across the landscape of industrial control systems. Uh, next slide, please. So key point on this slide is cyber attacks just about two months ago, Oldsmar, Florida, as you know, that's a local water system or wastewater system where the, the city's water treatment plant was successfully breached via the accessing of its industrial control systems. And this breach was used to increase remotely on the part of a bad actor, the sodium hydroxide concentrate inside uh, the drinking water piece. So uh, these, these actors, uh, they were aided and abetted by a lot of sloppy cyber hygiene as depicted in the two sub bullets there under the second primary bullet. They gained access through a widely used commercial application. Uh, lots of people in the company used it for convenience to be able to do things, monitor and remotely control the system um, from a cyber sense from their homes, working in a COVID environment, for example. However, that same ease of access was, was leveraged by, by the malicious actors to gain access. Um, Another interesting thing was every one of these people used the same password, so that, that was a very interesting non-cyber defense on the part of that water system. And the, the, uh, the operating systems for the cybersecurity software on the systems were out of date and no longer being serviced by the, uh, by the vendor. So an entire constellation of badness on the part of the defense came together to enable that attack to be successful. Uh, next slide, please. Perhaps one of the most... Um, unbelievable things that happened recently that brings this into the realm of reality with respect to industrial control systems was the attacks uh, of on the Ukrainian power grid in, in 2015 and 2016 um, that involved a combination of Russian government, Russian mafia, Russian criminal organizations, and very, very talented and smart individual cyber hackers that the Russian government was able to purchase for hire. That combination of smart brains and talent was able to go on a almost a D-Day like uh, pre-invasion campaign of open source mining, understanding the different types of industrial control systems that were applied by the Ukrainian power grid. Um, they were able to get a detailed list of the specs and, and all kinds of uh, interesting data from the vendor websites. Um, they used in com a combination of various different tactics, techniques and procedures to gain access to the systems to get into the systems and do a very extensive uh, beachhead reconnaissance, and then multiple uh, forms of attack against this Ukrainian power grid. Um, we'll go to the next slide, and I believe this is my next to last slide. Just kind of a summary of how complex this Ukrainian power grid attack was. And the thing that saved the Ukrainians is that a lot of their systems, unlike ours, uh, were not as up-to-date and automated as they could have been. Uh, based on resource issues and other things. And that in fact helped save the day because they were able to go to manual backup capabilities fairly quickly. And they also had a, a cadre of, of graybeards that actually knew how to run the systems manually, which, which helped them uh, recover a lot more quickly than if we were in the same boat. But again, this was a complex multi-stage op, prior compromise of corporate networks, a simple spear phishing emails, fooling people into clicking on, on bad actor websites and to basically giving up key information, including uh, passwords and other, other key credentials. They did this for about six months. 
They also leverage people that were using their private networks to connect into their, their official capacity in some shape, way, shape, or form vis-a-vis -vis the power grid. Once they got in, they uh, remotely shut down substations. They physically destroyed or caused an overload of infrastructure components, rendering them uh, functionally useless. They simultaneously launched massive denial of uh, distributed DDoS attacks on call centers to deny customers information on the response and to actually hinder the response in many important ways. And as they backed out, they burned bridges behind them, destroying equipment and wiping things off the, off the earth, rendering them um, non-usable uh, for, for the rest of eternity. So this was a very incredible thing that was now six years old. So imagine how much now the capabilities of those same attackers must have matured. Uh, we can only hope that on the defensive side, we're experiencing a similar level of maturity with respect to our capabilities or we're, we're in trouble. And I'll go to my last slide on that happy note before I turn it over to Eileen Decker to bring your morale even lower through the ransomware attack explanation. Um, I just wanna say that my bottom line here is that because everything in our government and society is now so interconnected and especially the essential services that we provide, including the community that you guys represent that are on this, on this, uh, in this session with us today. This makes us all very vulnerable as a society, as an economy, and as a system of governments all the way down from the local level to the federal government level. And because of these very incredible interconnected dependencies and interdependencies, threats that are at, affected and they're successful are, have the ability to do things that we've never seen before here in the United States of America with respect to turning off the switches and the keys and the power and the communications across multiple sectors and subsectors and essentially denying the capabilities of governments across the board potentially to provide essential services to the communities that they serve. And I'm not sure that there's any other scenario outside of nuclear detonation in the past that could have brought this much uh, havoc to us as a nation, but unfortunately it's with us now. Um, and I'm glad to see that there are folks like you that are concerned about it and that are engaged in this operational fight uh, every single day. And we just need to continue to, to try to outsmart these guys because I can tell you they're putting the best and brightest against us. So Eileen, I think I'll turn the mic over to you now for your thoughts. Well, thank you, Bob. Uh, very much appreciate that overview of the complex array of cyber threats that we are all facing. Uh, this is indeed a very challenging, challenging landscape of threats. And as Bob indicated, I'm here to present yet one more to you. Um, and I've been asked to review ransomware, as you can tell uh, from the slide in front of you, and, and to summarize some of the work that I've been doing for the Naval Postgraduate School in terms of looking at what's been happening around the country, particularly with uh, municipalities. Uh, before I get into the details, obviously just wanna be sure we're all on the same page and ensure there's a baseline of information uh, about what ransomware is. We've all heard about it, but just to be clear, um, at its core, it's that malicious software that's designed to gain unauthorized access to a system. Hackers then control the data effectively, holding it hostage, and unavailable to the victim until a ransom is paid. If it's not paid, the data remains unavailable to the victim. And if it is paid, it's frequently given back. Not always, uh, but frequently it is given back. There is somewhat, at least at the current time, a code amongst the ransomware hackers that if word gets out that people don't get their data back, uh, they won't pay these ransoms. Um, it should be noted, however, that there are a number of, of offshoot organizations and uh, independent hackers uh, that are not honoring that code. And that certainly is something uh, just to always uh, be aware of. The most typical ways that um, it can happen uh, through a variety of means, many of which Bob has already explained, but the most common threat vectors are email phishing campaigns, remote desktop protocol vulnerabilities, software vulnerabilities. Um, and the common thread throughout this is they take advantage of uh, vulnerabilities in the systems. Um, in terms of how frequent uh, ransomware is, it is very hard to put an exact figure on how common 
this is. We all know from reading about it, it is very common, but the numbers regarding how common vary greatly. The FBI uh, publishes data uh, between 2013 and 2019, they estimate that at least uh, about 145 million in Bitcoin coin has been paid out in ransomware. Um, most people believe that's a gross underestimation. Um, they just issued, by the way, the FBI, their IC3 report for 2020, where they report about 2,500 ransomware complaints, uh, totaling in about $30 million of losses. Again, most uh, believe that that is an underreporting of the crime, uh, but this IC3 system that the FBI has, their internet uh, uh, complaint center, uh, this is a voluntary reporting system where victims of crime go to report what has happened to them. So it is uh, an underreported system, but at least it's one way of measuring what is out there. But the private sector has done a great deal of analysis as well and have issued a lot of reports. Some private companies estimate that ransomware gangs are making uh, or made in 2020, at least $250 million. That's about 10 times the FBI estimate. And by their count, there was a 300% increase from 2019 to 2020. Uh, that figure they put together by compiling transactions to blockchain uh, addresses that were linked to ransomware attacks. In another graph, let's go to the next slide. Uh, this one uh, put forth by Chainalysis, it shows over five years the growth in uh, estimated growth in ransomware. All of this data remains um, estimates for sure. Uh, we don't know the precise amount. We can all agree in all of these uh, institutions and analysis and studies agree that it is on the rise. It will continue to be on the rise because it is relatively easy to execute. And everyone is vulnerable to this. If we could go to the next slide, CrowdStrike uh, recently just issued a report, their, um, their global threat reports for 2021. Um, and they looked at ransomware operations, recognizing it is a crime, uh, an opportunistic crime. Uh, they identified the highest number of ransomware associated uh, data extortion operations in 2020 to be industrial and engineering sector, closely followed by the manufacturing sector. This is a uh, focus on uh, the private sector. The FBI has also looked at government institutions. They, throughout 2020, have been issuing notices upon notices to uh, the government uh, sectors and ransomware networks associated with police departments, fire departments, state, local, tribal, territorial governments, municipalities, hospitals, and other infrastructure because the consequences of attacks on first responders is obviously so high and can involve life-threatening uh, uh, situations. So their uh, notices are all designed to heighten the alert within all of these organizations to be prepared for this type of, of threat. But of course, as we know, in terms of the consequences, it doesn't all have to be about life-saving equipment. Um, any data that has value, value from the user's perspective, um, is uh, data that is subject and vulnerable to ransomware. That's why they go after school systems. A lot of people say, why are they going after school systems? It's because the data is so valuable to the schools and to their operation and proper functioning. It's not that it has an independent value on, say, an open market. Um, next slide, please. Uh, we've heard, of course, about uh, some very significant attacks uh, throughout the nation, some of them are famous, the Baltimore, Atlanta, uh, Colorado Department of Transportation. These are some of the more significant uh, attacks, but there have been attacks on tiny municipalities, Sparks, uh, Nevada, much smaller as compared to some of these larger cities. Um, each of the attacks have caused uh, great disruption in functioning of the cities. Um, obviously, as I said, these are not the only cities. I'm not gonna pick on these cities. I wanna make it clear. Um, each of these jurisdictions were, were victims of a crime, uh, but there are many cities around the country and many um, uh, localities that they had mere miss misses as well. And there were many, many lessons to be learned. Um, one of the things to note here is you know, the amount of the ransom, usually it's at a relatively 
uh, manageable size for municipalities. Um, in some cases, it's pretty clear that hackers looked at the municipalities and determined uh, what amount of money did the chief executive have the authority to spend without having to go get legislative approval. Um, it is clear some hackers have done deep dives on municipalities to know what the right price point is to get the ransomware. Um, and of course, the cost of recovery um, as reported publicly for certainly the two big cities, Atlanta and Baltimore, um, is quite great, 17 to $18 million to recover. The issue always comes up to pay or not to pay, and that is a very complex problem in and of itself. The FBI, of course, recommends not paying. There are many reasons to not pay, including uh, that it is funding a criminal organization. Uh, it, it's clear they use the money to perpetuate this this fraud, um, and um, it, it's, it's but it's quite expensive to to not pay. And we've heard even this morning about jurisdictions that did pay to unlock their data. And there certainly are the reasons to pay, as you can see, the cost of recovery. Some of these cities, I'll say, public statements made by the IT leader in Atlanta said. Uh, I understand we're investing a lot of money, paying a lot of money to recover, but what we have to think about is for years, maybe even decades, Atlanta has not invested in its IT infrastructure. And what we're doing now is investing in that infrastructure. And part of that 17 and $18 million that was spent um, is to fortify the systems to protect it moving forward and in the future. In terms of answering that question, um, most of the cities who've gone through this type of an attack say it is important to think about this well ahead of time, understand, get better information, understand what data you have lost, what your potential exposure is, uh, when was the last time you backed up your information, how much data will you actually lose, how much time will it take to rebuild, um, and are you able to replace the systems easily. Uh, they recommend having these conversations well in advance, while any um, uh, emergency, of course, presents its own challenges as well as its uh, new facts that have to be encountered. Thinking through these issues and having the decision makers, the policy uh, makers in each jurisdiction really think those questions ahead of time are critically important for recovery. And of course, understanding if the jurisdiction has insurance. Um, that is a relatively uh, new factor in the game. Um, and how much the insurance uh, will pay, not pay, and all the ramifications of that as well. Um, next slide, please. I'm gonna turn to uh, some of the uh, lessons learned uh, from additional lessons learned from all of these jurisdictions. One of the keys to remember is that these attackers are not just coming after your jurisdiction, your entity. Uh, you may feel very alone in that moment, but some of these uh, particularly the, the bigger attacks, um, the hackers are interrelated. So for example, the city of Atlanta, though that same group, the same group of hackers went after the city of Newark, the Colorado Department of Transportation, Hollywood Presbyterian Medical Center, the Kansas Heart Hospital, the Port of San Diego, and a university in Canada. The same group of people went after all these different organizations. Uh, why? because they're trying to make money, they're finding vulnerabilities in their systems and they're able to get through. Similarly, but this is the same we know uh, with, with hackers overall. Sony Pictures, when, uh, when uh, Sony was taken down, uh, that same group went after the Bank of Bangladesh, a US defense contractor. Um, these, these groups are um, uh, very, uh, prolific in, in their work, and they are able to go after uh, many institutions, which is why, as recommended by these uh, or the entities that have been hacked, it's important to get law enforcement involved very early because they are able to make the connections that um, an independent jurisdiction would not have access to. Uh, why don't we go to the next slide? A few other um, uh, lessons learned from uh, the collective and uh, their recommendations is to keep in mind um, that the uh, ransomware will happen when you are most vulnerable. Uh, why? Because 
They want to increase the likelihood of your ability or your desire to pay them. They will come after you when you are desperate. That is why, for example, schools get hit a lot more at the beginning of the school year or near graduation to interfere with the proper functioning of the school districts. Hospitals and healthcare uh, facilities in the last year, we've all read about the increase in the attacks, uh, but the attempts and successful attacks increased dramatically at key points during the pandemic. Uh, in the first month, the FBI sent out a notice about a 400% increase in attacks against medical facilities. When we were having the second wave, I think it was the second wave in, in October, um, it spiked again and the FBI sent out a notice of an increase in eminent cybercrime threat. One hacking group, in fact, ended up attacking more than 400 hospitals requiring one of those hospitals to revert completely to pen and paper. Baltimore and Atlanta had new mayors newly elected or appointed, uh, both of whom had made public statements about that before they had become mayor and before these attacks, they actually hadn't given too much thought to uh, cyber attacks uh, prior to becoming mayor and having uh, experienced that. Um, many of the cities involved, uh, many of the municipalities, um, frequently in the interest of transparency, had public reports on files about their infrastructure flaws and vulnerabilities. I am not suggesting that the hackers looked those up, uh, but in the cases of many uh, big cities, including Baltimore and Atlanta, and it came out uh, publicly afterwards, they had public reports on file about highlighting uh, the city's failure to invest in IT infrastructure, that backup systems were not utilized effectively, outlining their outdated systems, and in some cases making recommendations, consistent recommendations to invest and upgrade in the systems. Many of those requests obviously went unheeded. Um, I am not criticizing Baltimore or Atlanta, by the way. Uh, those of us who've worked in government at every need level know that this happens all the time. Uh, that we're all dealing or have dealt with older systems, infrastructure needs repair, budgets are tight, choices have to be made, and inevitably at any point in time, certain, certain things just aren't funded at the level anyone would like. But of course, after the attack, all of those reports come to light and are very publicly uh, reviewed, uh, and they do highlight a fairly systematic failure to invest in the upgrades, the upgrades that are so necessary. Uh, and that the reports highlight needed to be made. Uh, they highlight the failure to invest, the failure to train, the failure of backup systems, the failures and insufficiency of storage systems. Another thing that um, all the jurisdictions learned is that they will release your information uh, and that is a risk in not paying. Uh, they will threaten to release your information, particularly if they're able to identify um, information that's uh, proprietary in nature um, embarrassing in nature, we saw in the Sony hack, uh, they started releasing emails that were particularly embarrassing. Um, and in other cases, in other cities, they experienced the hackers going on Twitter and taunting them, taunting their mayors and elected officials for not paying. And in some cases, uh, the hackers released the amount of money uh, that they were asking for and would say, hey, look, we're asking for relatively uh, low amount of money um, and you're elected officials are spending all this money to try to repair, we'll give them the data back today if they just pay. Um, we should expect more taunting, more releasing of information, particularly if it's embarrassing uh, or critical information about um, key structures within a city. They have the information, uh, they threaten and frequently do uh, release the information. In terms of GIS, um, there are some lessons that have been learned regarding uh, GIS. For example, the city of Sparks, uh, Nevada has made some very public statements about uh, when they were subject to a ransomware attack. Uh, they learned early on that their GIS data had been impacted. And with respect to that city specifically, all of their flyover pictures of the city um, had been encrypted and they did not have access to it. Now the city itself was able to um, protect itself from the attack into a, a large degree. They disconnected many of the infected machines from the network, uh, but as they started to try to restore their systems and to use their backup systems to help, um, they were able to do a lot of that quickly, except when it came to their GIS data. 
and they did have backups of the data, but their backup library was um, not really state of the art. And what ended up happening, and they found it being very challenging for them, is they had to restore all their GIS data from tapes being maintained from an offsite vendor on tapes that they had to feed each tape library one by one. And it was a painfully slow task. It took them weeks to restore their GIS data as they had huge files uh, that were stored in slower um, backup systems. And uh, that was a lesson that they learned. It was a very slow and excruciating process for them. Other cities and counties uh, with respect to GIS data, what they learned is while the tech people uh, frequently understood the interrelationship of their GIS systems to their, their main systems and the impact it had, the cascading impact loss of GIS would have. It was pretty clear uh, that policymakers did not understand. Even if they heard the GIS system uh, was taken out or is temporarily unavailable, they didn't understand what that really meant. They didn't have an understanding of the cascading impact. They didn't understand in one case that their GIS system um, impacted uh, water services. They didn't understand that uh, because addresses were being stored in GIS that the processing of deals and real uh, deeds and real estate transactions would be greatly impacted. So mapping that out and uh, translating that uh, for policymakers um, is, is turning out to be very, very critical in order to ensure policymakers have the information they need to make all the critical decisions that need to happen when there is an attack. That brings up uh, an issue we've talked about, cascading impacts and mapping, um, really understanding uh, the mapping of the interconnectedness of your own systems, uh, let alone how it connects to other jurisdictions. But many jurisdictions have reported that the entry port points, as Bob said earlier, and the vulnerabilities, they didn't understand their own system well enough to know that um, some of their servers that they thought had been offline and they, they had not been upgrading uh, for software were still connected in some way to the internet and it allowed a point of entry. Really having solid mappings of your own systems um, is critically important. Finally, I'll turn to the preparation area uh, that many of these jurisdictions continually noted. Um, they noted even when they're successful and feel like they, they survived uh, without paying a lot of money and were able to uh, segregate their systems and protect them, overall, they determined that not enough resources have been spent on monitoring their networks largely due to the large number of um, security events that are happening every single day and the need to monitor systems 24 seven. Even in Colorado, they felt that their response was very good, uh, very successful, frankly, in terms of uh, limiting any impact of the ransomware attack, um, uh, largely considered a very, very successful response and recovery to an attack. They noted that their planning could have been improved uh, tremendously. They noted that their state emergency operations plan um, and the, uh, the IT, the cyber incident response plan were not integrated enough and operationalized enough. As a result, they felt that they needed a more systematic approach to an escalating incident uh, that they felt did not exist in their current planning. They also noted that while they felt um, uh, that their IT staff was well-versed in cyber incident response, that the team was not as well-versed in incident command system approach. Um, and they stated having ICS trained personnel on the cyber incident response team would have facilitated a common approach to incident handling. Um, they also noted that their response plan was not as operational as it could have been, not as well rehearsed as it could have been, um, and it, they could have, be, it would have facilitated a more confident um, employment of the plans that they did have. Uh, they also noted on their continuity of operations plan, concluded it did not account for all the challenges associated to a significant cyber incident. And here's an example. They said their plans assumed that their employees would be able to take their computers with them, go to the new location, plug them in, 
and have connectivity in that new location, as opposed to planning for when everybody has to go back to pencil and paper. Um, they also noted it's important to work better with third party vendors to understand their vulnerabilities and their interconnectedness to your systems. Um, and the keys to success, having backup systems, having them done frequently, and the segmentation of systems that allow to protect the rest of your system while containing a threat um, and an attack on another. Um, those are some of the lessons learned from all of these jurisdictions, but we have more to learn today in getting a baseline uh, approach to managing all of this. And we're gonna hear now from Jim Featherstone and his emergency management approach. Jim, off to you. Thank you, Eileen. Um, so uh, GIS, it's not new, it, as you all know very well, it's been around for a long time, but it's, it's gained considerable momentum and significance in terms of the public safety and public policy communities. Uh, one of the things Eileen didn't mention it, but when she was with the city of LA, she insisted on us doing joint exercises, the IT uh, operators and decision makers uh, having joint exercises with consequence managers and coordinators, because that way the, the IT threat, the identification, the thwarting, et cetera, and also the impact, there was, there was good communication between the, uh, the operators and, and the coordinators for, for the city in a, in a pretty complex municipal environment. Uh, crisis communications, um, GIS has been, become a big part of that. COVID uh, definitely has been uh, a lot of downs, but I guess a relative up would be that, that the, the general community, the, the whole community has become a lot more dependent on what GIS brings to bear in a crisis. Next slide, please. So this dashboard, not this specific one, but the, uh, the Johns Hopkins dashboard, probably one of the most viewed GIS products probably in the last decade. Uh, it, it has made a believer uh, out of folks from you know, John Q or Jane Q citizen to the, the highest governmental officials on what GIS brings to bear in, in, a, in a fight, you know, so to speak, because the, the, this, the COVID, COVID is actually a fight. Uh, so, you know, whereas we were, we were trying, and you all know very well, we were trying to get uh, a market share in terms of attention and understanding the value of the capability GIS uh, would bring to bear as, as, as little as uh, three, or three to four years ago, in the last 14 months, now GIS is on everybody's, uh, you know, lips, you know, everybody's looking for these products. Next slide. So it made me think of a book I read years ago when I went back to college after the, uh, the Navy in the mid seventies by Marshall McLuhan uh, from McGill University up in Canada. He talked about the medium is the massage. And at that time he was talking about television, how television was shrinking the global, the, the, the globe uh, from a, a number of countries to actually a global village. So what you all have done in a lot of your jurisdictions and, and across the country is that, that you've, 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 uh, the medium of GIS has actually shrunk the, uh, the, the nation, but it's also raised the expectation and, the, and whetted the appetite uh, for more and more GIS capability. Next slide, please. So what keeps me up awake, what, what keeps me up at night? Um, you know, just looking at the, 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 the GIS capabilities out there. Next slide. So next slide, I'm sorry. So it's, it's not the Stafford Act, you know? I mean, it is, but it isn't because the Stafford Act has 16 major disasters. Um, those aren't necessarily applicable to all of us. So, and of course, me being a firefighter, I wanna simplify things. So next slide. I came up with in Southern California, what I was concerned about was what I call the Magnificent Seven. It's ironic because in the this uh, uh, classic Western, these, these seven cowboys, they were, they did good. So the irony was that we called our most significant, our seven most significant threats and hazards in Southern California, the Magnificent Seven. Next slide. So my Magnificent Seven were pandemic or public health crisis. We were talking about this years ago, going all the way back to, we, you know, from SARS to H1N1 to Ebola, 
Um, you know, so that, that was very important. Violent actors, we've seen that just recently, you know, within days, that's still a challenge for crisis managers. Catastrophic earthquake. Uh, we feel it a lot here. Uh, we had a 3.9, 4.0 the other uh, morning. Woke everybody up in my household. Um, catastrophic wildfire. So very, very much important. Adverse weather. Uh, we called it climate change originally, but when it wasn't politically correct to talk about climate change, we just changed it to adverse weather. We've seen that across the nation. That's a big challenge. That's one of the things that has kept us awake at night. Large public assemblages. And then, of course, the cyber crisis. Next slide. So the, the public health uh, crisis of the pandemic is very important. This, like I said, this boogeyman has been around uh, with us here, certainly in, in my uh, professional uh, time uh, in this business with, like I said, SARS, H1N1, Ebola, and numerous anthrax scares. We had the, uh, the BioWatch system here, which uh, detected weaponized anthrax or weaponized bioagents. Uh, so, but the thing is, is that that was, um, the information that we got from systems like that was part of, it was big data, but it wasn't necessarily uh, usable information. So through the art, science, and skill of the GIS professionals we were able to work with in this area, we were able to actually give that, that, uh, that information some analysis, some presentation uh, capability that made it shareable, and give it geospatial context. Uh, next slide. So the public health crisis, you know, it's kind of like hazmat. Uh, you may not be able to see it, taste it, smell it, or feel it, but initially, but it's there. Uh, it's typically moving, and we, as we, and we saw this with uh, uh, COVID. It, it, the public health uh, crisis typically moves at the speed of the the transportation conveyances of the day. In 1918, it moved at the speed of locomotives and steamships, and today, uh, COVID or the variants now move around the world at the speed of a jetliner. Next slide. Violent actors uh, from 911, uh, terrorists, hate crimes, mental health uh, issues, violent actors continue to be a challenge. Uh, police departments, uh, uh, emergency medical departments, hospitals all use the GIS capabilities uh, when dealing with our far too frequent violent actor issues in this country. Next slide. Uh, just be, in fact, GIS has been significant in terms of the analysis of the effects, unfortunately, after a, a violent actor or violent actors uh, do their bad deeds. Next slide. Catastrophic earthquake. Like I said, we, we had one here re, uh, just a, was it two days ago, Eileen? Um, it's crazy. It's probably about two or three miles from our respective homes, which gave us a really good shake in the wee hours. But uh, those of you who are on the uh, call or on the webinar from the uh, Pacific Northwest, I know uh, Clark's very concerned about the new Cascadia, uh, the impacts of that, what it will do, not just to infrastructure, but to things like the supply chain on the, in the Pacific Rim and to uh, you know, Alaska and beyond. Uh, and also it, it will probably reach inland far, uh, a lot further than we want. The new Madrid. The New Madrid, New Madrid earthquake is something we talk about. Fracking. Uh, we're always, uh, we have this hunger for new energy uh, sources. Fracking also has the, uh, uh, the collateral impact of, of causing shifting of the earth. Uh, with earthquakes, especially for us here uh, on the West Coast, it's not uh, if it'll happen, but when. Next slide. So the GIS capability and prowess been, has been able to give us some sort of uh, I won't say predictability, but we've been able, been able to, to actually show in, almost in real time or near real time the impact and effect of a seismic event, whether it's an earthquake or tsunami or subsequent tsunami across, around the Pacific Rim. Next slide. Catastrophic wildfire, huge. Uh, who's on the call? Uh, uh, Daniel was talking about uh, uh, the wildfire uh, concern where he is. Um, is it climate change? Is it forest and land management? All of those uh, different potential effects or, or feeders into the wildfire phenomenon in this country, uh, you know, they ride on the shoulders of the GIS capability that you all have developed and honed over the years. Uh, GIS uh, has allowed us to look at the effects of urbanization 
on the wildland interface uh, impact. The Bel Air fire, which happened, I believe, in 1961, we lost 450 homes then. Catastrophic in, in, in 1961. It would be catastrophic today to lose 450 homes. But in a fraction of that area, using GIS mapping, the analytics and stuff, 30,000 homes now exist in a third of the area that the Bel Air fire covered in 1961. So what, so what, what do we understand or what are we able to know and discern through the science and art of GIS in terms of what would be the impact if the Bel Air fire happened today in Los Angeles? Next slide. You all, the wizards, are able to take a satellite shot and actually be able to show the, what, what are the impacts of a fire down to the smoke. You know, I mean, here, you know, down here with my feet on uh, terra firma, I can't see that, but it, it shows the magnitude and the impact and also with the, the modeling of uh, showing where the jurisdictions are, the, the population density, those kind of things, taking big data and actually, you know, giving it some analytical and geospatial context, help us be able to help us make much better and more relevant and time uh, uh, important decisions. Next slide. Looking at the impact. You know, what's the cost? You know, in recovery, the GIS capability is huge. Recovery is the longest and most expensive of the phases of emergency management. So being able to apply the art and science of GIS to the recovery aspect has made us much more effective in terms of decisions, you know, uh, in, the, in, the, in the long drawn out recoveries and the costly recoveries that come as a result of uh, the wildfire, uh, especially the interface uh, aspect. Uh, next slide, please. Adverse weather. There's no doubt that the weather, uh, or at least our knowledge of weather changes, have, have grown exponentially over the last decade. Uh, next slide, please. So using the, capability of, uh, the capabilities of GIS, we're able to, to map the impact and also the, the, predict the predictiveness of, uh, of weather and the adverse weather uh, by using the, the, the tools that you all have been able to build. Next slide, please. Going back to the recovery piece, we're able to also look at the damage. This is from a global level, looking at the damage of the adverse weather around the, around the globe. Next slide. Large public assemblages. So you take those five threats or hazards that, that I've just uh, blown through real quickly here, and you overlay, what's the human capital issue? Large public assemblages, how many people, what, you know, what, what's, what's the, uh, the impact, you know, uh, on, on the people that have to move from an area? Uh, we used uh, the GIS capability here in LA for one of our wildland interface fires to actually help us with our evacuation efforts. We looked at the effort, we, we, we had the real-time fire line, which was fed to uh, the, the wizards uh, via drone and, uh, and uh, fire, uh, fire service aircraft. We overlaid that over a specific area. Then we, we, we put in things like uh, median income, uh, privately owned vehicles, streets, what streets were open, what streets were closed. So using the GIS capability, we were able to model and then actually implement an effective evacuation uh, from the impacted areas. So the other thing is that the large public assemblages uh, these days, they, they might not be uh, planned. They might be spontaneous. Uh, we had a, a, a lot of public assemblage uh, issues uh, when the, uh, during the Ferguson event several years ago, but using GIS capabilities, real-time GIS capabilities, we were able to, to actually manage what happened uh, over the course of several nights. And then, so that's, that's six of the things that kept me awake um, for probably 20 years of my 30 year career in uh, the public safety world. Um, uh, now that I, as my wife says, I'm in failed retirement, they probably still keep me awake too much. But the, the final one, next slide, is the cyber crisis. So like I said, um, one of the things that, that, that Eileen uh, pushed us to do in the city of LA was to um, the folks that manage the backbone, uh, you know, in the IT structures here, um, how do we interface, how do we interact with the people who had consequence management and situational awareness responsibilities? 
so that because it had to be a, a, a lot of synchronicity there because they had to work hand in glove, knowing that you've had a, a cyber attack, it, you know, and, and what, it, what, it, what it looks like to someone sitting behind a 15 inch monitor, you know, how does this cyber attack translate to streetlights not working? Your, your, uh, your, your public water system, the, the computer control valving not working, the gas system, the valving and not working, your pumps not working, your, your, uh, your subway or your light rail system not working, uh, your airports not working. So knowing what the cyber attack is, uh, so how does that translate into what the impact is and how do you recover from a cyber attack? Next slide. So, Cybersecurity, uh, and uh, I like Bob. Bob uh, talked, and I hadn't heard it before, but it makes sense. He talked about the cyber hygiene. You know, the cyber hygiene, and so many of you on this call are GIS subject matter experts, and either you you work in a group where other people are responsible for the cyber hygiene or the the backbone that your systems take advantage of or ride on, and some of you are the person. You know, so the, the, the cybersecurity uh, of the GIS capability is huge. And, and you know, uh, I learned a long time ago is that it starts with, with uh, you know, the, the Luddite and my fingers on keys. You know, how, how security conscious am I? You know, because I, I'm the most vulnerable link in, in the cyber and the, uh, the GIS systems that, that, I, that I have access to. Next slide. So going back to your, your, your respective GIS capabilities, and this is you know, symbolically, you know, how dependent are you on internal data? How dependent are you on external data? What are the vulnerabilities? And what's your plan B? What's the failover? You know, it's the, you know, the old adage is not about you know, uh, how many times you get knocked down. It is how, how often and how well you get back up. So all systems are vulnerable. Um, and, and fortunately, we've made or we've created a, a value add or a dependency or an expectation on GIS capabilities, which took a long time to convince people. You know, like I said, uh, Peter Hanna's on the call now, and I remember listening to him several years ago, and I'm thinking, well, if this firefighter believes that it works, maybe it works, maybe I can actually spell GIS, you know? So um, it, it's... It, it, it's become a very significant tool. Um, two years ago with the wildfires, the very significant wildfires here in Los Angeles, uh, one of the systems and the, and the organizations I work with, we, we were one of a handful of GIS providers. Roll the clock back you know, 10, uh, nine, 10 months now, we, we realized that we were just another straw in the broom in terms of GIS capability. The appetite and the dependency and the need uh, for GIS capabilities is huge. So it goes back to a question I used to get early on when we were trying to, uh, for all intents and purposes, sell governmental agencies on GIS. They were like, well, well, why should we go with this? What happens if we lose power? It's a very, sim very simple question, but that was always the, the, the ringer in the back of everyone's mind that if they went with this new bet you by golly wow, you know, uh, this, this snake oil of GIS, you know, what happens if the power goes out? And we said, well, you, you, you won't do anything more than what you're doing right now. So let's move forward. Fortunately, we were able to move several of the, the response and support cultures forward and, and, and show them the value add that, that you all bring to the table. But it, go, it goes back to asking ourselves, you know, of these layers in the little graphic here on the screen, how many of those are, are vulnerable, uh, you know, to uh, a cyber event? Next slide, please. So, you know, so what keeps us awake at night? That, that's the big question when it comes to cyber, you know, um, interconnectivity. Several speakers have talked about interconnectivity. Interconnectivity is a boon and a bust. Um, it, it, it's very important. It's essential. I mean, and it's a great thing. Uh, somebody says, because uh, one of the things that we talked about when I was with the Homeland Security Advisory Council is we, we tried to dispel the notion of a common operating picture. 
because law enforcement has a responsibility to look at the, the crisis of the day through the lensing and based upon the missions, roles, and responsibilities of law enforcement. The same for fire, the same for public works, the same for emergency management, the same for your mass care and shelter folks. So everybody's going to look at this, this the, the challenge a little differently, and that's okay. But the common data, which, which is shared through interconnect, interconnectivity, that, that's, that's the key. You know, so like I said, interconnectivity is a boon and a bust. Um, a bigger challenge, especially uh, here in the era of COVID, is the virtual or the remote nature of work. Uh, as we tend to be more, more, more distant, you know, we, we no longer uh, we no longer staff the 96 seat emergency operations center here in the city of Los Angeles. You know, the this the this huge EOC is now all virtual. But that virtual uh, posture depends upon interconnectivity and cybersecurity. I, command control and coordination efforts are more dependent on what you all have developed and continue to develop today than they ever have been. But what are our vulnerabilities? Clark? You know, uh, let's go back to the, let's go back to the panel. So uh, like kind of on a personal level, whenever I'm feeling down, I usually call up either Jim or Bob or Eileen because I realize very quickly like, my problems are minuscule. Uh, and I just also wanted to say that, that all of our SMEs are available for children's parties um, and other celebrations. Uh, so now I, this, is, this is so important to stare in the face and, and get the, 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 the facts of the reality we live in because that's how we begin the discussion that's going to take us through the rest of this event, the rest of this seminar. What can we uh, uh, present you know, to one another and ultimately to decision makers that uh, identifies what we need to do, what, how we can increase our preparedness and mitigation strategies? What are our ideas uh, about what we can do in times of calm, of organizing efforts uh, between GIS uh, uh, professionals, emergency management, I think those are the two legs of the stool really, and, and executives who are making decisions. Um, I, I wanna make you know, the next uh, uh, really half of this event, uh, including our breakout sessions about your ideas. Let's turn this into an idea factory. But I think as a predicate to that, we also have to have very clear eyes about what it is we're confronting. That's why we uh, gave the floor to uh, our three subject matter experts to, to kind of lay out the challenges. And, and quite frankly, uh, that's probably not the total picture. Uh, there's more nightmares out there that we don't even have time to get to. Uh, in particular, I like the Jim's uh, orienting us toward an emergency management perspective, because I think that's the partnership. Uh, between GIS and emergency management. I think GIS permeates all kinds of different uh, societal needs and functions, as well as in the private sector. But for what we're talking about today, I think that that relationship may be the most, at least initially, important and successful. Um, I mentioned, you know, in my own past as the director of the Seattle Emergency Operations Center, that among the first folks I wanted at the planning table, not in the task table or the even support function uh, role, but uh, our senior GIS uh, uh, professionals, because I want their ideas. Uh, you know, Jim mentioned the word Luddite. If you look up the word Luddite in the dictionary, you'll see my picture. Uh, so I need, I need people a lot smarter than I am who have worked with GIS, who know what the capabilities are, uh, and so I'm, I'm going to be a, a diehard evangelist, as are, you know, Rand and Chris and Justin, that we need to continuously look at expanding the role of GIS in key decision making, key analytics, predictive and response analytics, uh, and, and as, as full partners, not as, as uh, uh, these talented group of folks who we say, I need a map of this. And it's kind of like the bring me a rock sort of, of uh, uh, it's tasking instead of integration. And I'm a great advocate for the integration and I continued to, to do uh, that work uh, on behalf of, of NAPSIC. So we're going to open up our conversation. I really now want to get to my core participants uh, and my board members. 
my colleagues uh, on the NAPSIG board. Uh, your thoughts on what you've just seen and heard, your ideas. What do we need to do to get ourselves into a better position of preparedness? What should we be thinking about doing uh, in advance of a disaster? What kind of relationships and systems should we be focused on and, and, and work to build? And we're going to move from there uh, into the breakout sessions. Where we're actually going to put these down in, in a kind of a more formal way. And that will be the takeaway uh, for all of you and for all of the folks that are Going to be tuning into this or sharing the information uh, among your colleagues and professionals and hopefully ultimately the decision makers who write those budgets and set the course of priorities within a jurisdiction. So uh, let's see that slide now. Here is our question. Collectively, let's size this up. Size up how well prepared we are, what we need to do to increase our preparedness, what are our vulnerabilities and, and consequences. And, and really, you know, uh, as, as the end point of this conversation, this important conversation, what should we be identifying and saying in, in a very uh, emphatic and, and comprehensive way? We should be doing. What should, what should the course forward look like? Uh, and in particular, how do we bring this uh, set of our recommendations and ideas and observations into the emergency management world, the disaster management response and recovery world? So. So back to the panel, floor is now open. I'm gonna to give you another instant poll in a little bit, but I'd like to hear from uh, some of our, our core participants and uh, then I'll be pivoting into our, uh, our board members. So any, th any thoughts, any thoughts, uh, ideas, comments, that sort of thing. Well, I'll kick it off there, Clark. Yeah, thanks, I think, man. yeah, I think um, not knowing, uh, you know, the participants that we have uh, in, a, in attendance and not really understanding the makeup of, of who is listening, sort of trying to uh, kind of um, spitball this a little bit and throw everyone into one bucket. Um, it, you know, part of it is I just don't know how advanced some of our members are or attendees here today are. The first thing that I think anybody should do, and this probably would, would apply to even those who are fairly advanced in IT, is you need to do an assessment. You need to, you can't fix something if you don't know what you're going to fix. So, um, you know, there are tools out there. Uh, there are professionals. I know that um, in, our, in our role here, we went out and hired a, a consultant, a cybersecurity consultant, and we are in the business of securing our environment. We are IT professionals who really understand cybersecurity, but we wanted to have somebody from the outside come in and do several things. One, number one, teach us some things we didn't know. Uh, we had to be PCI compliant uh, on credit cards, so we had training there. We wanted to have some training on uh, some new advanced things are coming down the line, uh, learning you know, about these uh, different types of uh, micro technologies, these things called containers. Uh, you may have heard of Docker and things like that. We just weren't really familiar with that. And then the third thing was having them come in and look at our systems and go, okay, here's sort of an audit. It wasn't a full on audit, but it was just more, hey, let's take a look at some things. I can tell you that can't be, uh, your money could not be spent any better than on somebody to come in and help get you going in the right direction. Because if you don't know where you're going and, and you're asking for money, you possibly could be wasting money. Bring in a, an expert, help you get that assessment, build that plan, and then you can get the money uh, to help fund the systems that you need to do and the consultants uh, and the training to help you get to where you need to go. That's, that is my recommendation. Great, thank you. And, and uh, can, can NAPS take assist in, in that? Uh, you know, is that part I of think, our, our charter or? Yeah, I mean, I don't know if that question was for me directly or not, but uh, I think there is a role for NAPSIG. Uh, I think as a facilitator, I think it's the role that we play, uh, having panels like this and, and having seminars is a good way of bringing awareness. Uh, and there's some very simple things that we can do in training. Um, you know, we can have some of our uh, partners or business partners or, or 
you know, corporate par partners who are um, very well versed in cybersecurity be a participant and doing some training sessions. Um, most of us in here are using Esri software. Uh, there may be some other GS software. Uh, they, Esri does a very good job of, of putting their systems together and helping give uh, you the tools to help secure your systems, but you have to know how to use them. You have to know how to do that. We can do some workshops in those areas. We can bring our corporate uh, partners along to help with uh, some of those presentations. And we can bring in those uh, experts like we've done today to really fine tune some things such as uh, a backup system. What are, you know, really dive into backup systems, uh, you know, uh, backing up to hard drive, backing up to cloud, backing up to tape, uh, which ones you use or do you use all three? Um, those are the type of things that we can do and help you get on the right path. So I think NAPSIC has a role, yes. Okay, great. Um, uh, so Robert, do you have something to, to share? I'm, I'm looking at my, my core participants here, but uh, please jump in. Yeah, I, I gave a lot of thought to this when you gave the, uh, gave the invite out last night. Two thirds of GIS is IS. And a lot of us come, I was that, uh, the GIS specialist uh, uh, with two other people uh, as a part of the IT staff at, at my local government when I started, right? And so there's a lot of uh, us that uh, are in those small to medium-sized organizations and you're a part of the IT staff and you somehow have segmented your stuff, your, yourself to like just focus on GIS and not on the complete understanding of the information systems piece of you know the databases um, and all the other connected systems, like when we were bringing on our crime analysis system and our and our planning software and bringing on uh, the wastewater system uh, asset management systems. When we start to have those conversations um, with other departments and looking at how we could geo enable the enterprise one of those pieces that sometimes gets lost is the, that other piece, right? The classic is like the wastewater treatment system that's got this one PC that's controlling all the SCADA and it's a Windows 95 machine, right? Or whatever, right? And then that becomes that, that, one, that vulnerability. Um, and so um, that good hygiene, uh, I think a lot of jurisdictions don't, uh, if you are in the IT, um, don't give you two, two access cards or two sets, sets of credentials. So when you need to be an administrator, then you, you log in separately um, so that you can uh, uh, segment uh, th those roles and, and, and authorities. Um, I think one of the keys as you know, in 2013, that you know, the advent of web GIS really became really clear in the EOC, where it's like a lot of uh, folks, you know, took advantage of. It. It's like, why am I printing a map every two hours? You know, let's just update the web map. And so now we, we have now moved into this very IoT, this very web centric way of doing things, and. Uh, don't have that plan B, you know, do you, you know, now that four terabyte uh, portable hard drives are there, do you have all the data that you need and how current is it? Like it, for the forest service, you know, be, prior to fire season, we send out all brand new hard drives of the latest data, but that's still a snapshot in time. So when's the last time you did a complete backup of, of your imagery and all those other layers that you've got? We, we talk about having rest services, but what if we don't have that, what do we have? Do we have tile packages for um, all our, our, our mobile applications? So if they, you're in a completely disconnected environment, uh, you can still do stuff. Do you, uh, so that when you go out to survey one, two, three, or, or you've got uh, those geocoding services that are, you can kind of embed within the system. Have you downloaded uh, here at the Red Cross, all our DA folks do have our regional um, surveys uh, that we can use in case we don't have a disaster specific survey. But uh, have you created those ahead of time? 
I think the most uh, capable person to be able to respond in, in a, a completely no communication environment would be your fire captain. Because to the right in his door is that large binder that's got everything, every paper map and all the, all the key infrastructure pieces that they need to keep at, and as well as all the mutual aid maps for, if, for their surrounding areas. So that would be one of those things that, you know, I've always been a firm believer of knowing everyone who's around me, uh, being in those, those cooperative base map uh, uh, arrangements, data sharing, uh, with your other organizations becomes really key on on having that plan B. You know, do you have you created uh, paper maps or you know, uh, data driven uh, um, map books, and you have those available? You know, and are they on, uh, updated on a regular basis? Because if you're around most communities. Uh, within six months, there's like five new subdivisions, right? Depending where you are. So it becomes really key to fit in that plan B part that you're keeping in, in mind that uh, disasters aren't going to be um, just in a single jurisdiction. They're going to cross boundaries like, like right. we've seen with right. wildfires, like we've yeah. seen with earthquakes. And I think that last piece that we need to keep in, in mind would be when when we focused on coordinated terrorist attacks and coordinated cyber attacks, um, what I think is going to be the next deal is that intersection of those are going to happen together. Like you're going to have someone uh, take out a substation to try, uh, or a series of substations to create a, a power outage situation and then do have a mass shooting, have a whatever. And, and so now you're gonna have an incident within an incident within an incident. And are we uh, as members of the situation unit um, in the EOCs thinking about how we can support those various, those uh, uh, yeah, right. responses? I think, I, yeah, I think it's an axiom that it, disasters tend not to occur in, in the singlets. Uh, they tend to be multifaceted, multi-layered events, uh, which, of course, uh, to uh, to uh, Eileen's point, is exactly when you know there's going to be the most likelihood of a follow-on kind of event like a cyber attack. I mean, it's when you're most vulnerable. Um, I'm going to ask Justin in just a second uh, about some of the things we've been talking about. You know, really involve not just having the, the GIS professionals with a plan B and, and maybe having, you know, updated uh, backup data in the event that they cannot rely upon other, you know, uh, uh, data access. But I mean, in some, some way, maybe cities and counties should be doing the same thing uh, so that when you're, you go dark or, or, or blind, you at least have hopefully current baseline information. Now, we in GIS can all help determine what that baseline information is. If you're going to go, if you're going to go dark, uh, but I want to. So I'm going to ask uh, Justin about that nexus and maybe take a look at his own uh, jurisdiction in Nashua. But if there, I'd like to hear some other comments. We got Scott, Peter, um, uh, 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 Cheryl, Tari. Uh, any any of your thoughts on on what what we're facing and what we can do to buy down this risk? What kind of systems we can be working to promote and and or uh, attempt to implement. Uh, yes, one, Scott. one thing that I found uh, really helpful, uh, I'm at the state level here in New Jersey, is that um, we're fortunate enough to have the CISO for the state is in our office. And he is very proactive. And in five years, he's gone from basically nothing to having about 20 to 30 full-time cybersecurity professionals working to make sure that the state systems are secure and being proactive and going out, reaching out to critical infrastructure uh, folks, reaching out down to the counties and municipalities and 
kind of pushing out the lessons learned, best practices, all that kind of stuff to get the awareness out there. And so the one drawback is that I get two or three emails a day about some new cyber attack. And I used to read them all, but now I can't even keep up with them. I, I'm lucky enough to be behind a big enough firewall where it's like, eh, he takes care of it. But it's uh, really important to have that kind of outreach going out and uh, at least for our case, getting the state on the same page and securing things. They had a issue a while back where there was a system to let outside folks into the state network uh, for access to certain things. And that was a single sign on and it had never changed, no requirement to change passwords or anything like that. And uh, they did a search, they were doing dark web research and everything and found that some of those were going out. And at one point, I think he said there, there were, I forget how many tens of millions of hits a day coming from overseas into the state system using that vector. Um, and since then, you know, they pushed out uh, multi-factor authentication for everyone and that, you know, nips that one in the bud, move on to the next one. Yeah. Interesting. So, Thank you. Thank you very much, Scott. Um, so, Justin, I mean, what looking into the landscape we're, you know, kind of peering at right now, um, how do you see uh, the best approaches to kind of meet some of these challenges? And in, 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 in I think particularly what we're talking about is, you know, that ability to integrate and function, say, when data is corrupted and no longer you know, dependable. Uh, but you've got a disaster or multiple disasters that GIS can help help serve. Sure. So I mean, we uh, we sort of have the cheat sheet since we've already been through uh, through the scenario, um, and there were a lot of changes that we made after you guys had come out. Um, one of them was actually an integration of our uh, information technology functions with our GIS team. Uh, previously, that had been a, a part of our assessing department, and there was some. They were sort of kind of doing their own thing uh, separately uh, from the rest of the IT services, but also the security functions of the IT division as well. Um, so that was, I think, a big change that we made afterwards to help ensure that everybody was on the same page around cybersecurity for the city. Uh, you had mentioned about, um, you know, data backups. That was another thing that we had uh, investigated after. Uh, we had done our exercise in Nashua. And one of the things that we did was an audit of all the uh, essential functions of the community, uh, but also to look at what data was necessary in order to perform those essential functions. And while that was certainly uh, valuable for a prospective cyber attack, it was even more valuable when we had to implement our continuity plans for COVID, just knowing how we were going to access all that data remotely, how people would be able to ensure secure access to it. Um, that uh, was an invaluable experience for us. And so consider the things that we talk about today as, as opportunities to improve other um, risk reduction measures for, for hazards that might not be related to cybersecurity at all. Great, thank you, Justin. Uh, I'd like to put up, uh, I think given our first video experience, um, I'm, I'm going to forego you know, playing the, the, the next videos, but I will provide for you a link so that you can watch them in their full HD glory uh, with, uh, with Justin's blessing, I'm sure. Because uh, they're kind of an interesting, you know, way to, to kind of conceptualize this. I'd like to, though, go to our next instant poll, which has to do with your size up of the level of preparedness we have in terms of, of, uh, of uh, our security, uh, cybersecurity. So if you would, uh, Please check where you all think you're at, um, and uh, and we'll take a look at those pretty quickly here. Um, my SME team, any follow-on from what you've been hearing so far? Uh, so uh, Jim or Eileen? Eileen. Uh, Clark, I just want to note that Peter's, uh, I think, been trying to express some thoughts. If you don't mind, uh, I oh, absolutely. I yes, I, I'm, I'm I'm being neglectful here, Peter. No, thanks, Eileen. Um, yeah, I, I remember being at, at a National Security Summit where our good friend uh, Steve Polikoff uh, uh, talked about how um, the national response 
is top down, but really it should be reverted to bottom up because most disasters occur at the local level. And when you look at GIS, the authoritative data is there too, right? So um, that whole idea of top down, I think is from the local standpoint is broken. And, and then I think authoritative data, you kind of need to put it into groups, right? And I think we're on a really, really interesting um, crossroads now where uh, we're going to have standardized data in next gen 911 data, especially with street center lines and address points, which are critical data sets when you're when you're responding, right? And the next gen 911 model can be built out to other data sets like parks and waterways, et cetera, et cetera. But I think what needs to happen too is that there needs to be a repository set up at the state level where the locals then feed up. It would negate any attack at a local level of losing that critical data. It's also going to be shared in the ESI net. So you'll be able to be pulling it out or pushing it in, in multiple formats. So I, I think, I think um, the next gen environment could be a solution for um this whole question about cybersecurity for GIS. Very interesting. I mean, that's a great, great concept. I mean, I, I know that one of the fastest way to, uh, you know, start a, a street fight when I was back in the city was to talk about consolidating with the county or the state. <laughs> but, but I, you know, there, there's, we're talking about secure and standalone uh, uh, systems as plan B. I mean, I think there's general agreement about that. I'm not being very detailed or specific about it, but if all your eggs are in a basket that can be upended and, and broken, well, you don't have an omelet. Uh, so, I, I mean, I, I, it's part of what I'm hearing you say, and I think it's absolutely critical. Let's take a look at the results of the instant poll. I'm not surprisingly, I mean, there's a lot of work being done and, uh, you know, I, but I, it's also not surprising that no one characterizes what we're, what the state we're in as being a high level of integration. Uh, but, uh, you know, it seems to me a, a re fairly realistic view that we've got gaps. That's one of the reasons we're gathered here today to identify those gaps and work toward figuring out at least the initial steps to meet them. Uh, but we're at the same time, not, you know, uh, in a high vulnerability, low capability and low integration state either. I mean, there's a lot of really good work being done, particularly between uh, the emergency management uh, sector and uh, the GIS sector and public safety generally. I was going to ask uh, Rand for some reflections on kind of where we're at now and, and uh, what we would like to see as we move forward. Well, the first thing I would say is from that poll, we need to find who those 2% of the people are that are way up there at high and let's find out what they're doing because they must be doing something, <laughs> there you go. something right yeah. that we need to, we need to share uh, around the country. Um, uh, but we do know there are some shining stars around the, uh, uh, around the country that are, that are doing well. And it, I think it's because of a lot of things, they have the right people in the right places. They have support from above, you know, from their, whoever, from the uh, elected officials, on down through so they get budgetary support to, so they can do the things that we all need uh, known to, to be done. So um, uh, Peter's uh, uh, thoughts were right on target, as you noted. One thing I, I, I don't want us to forget, and I think we're going to talk more about that in the breakouts from a SCADA standpoint, but um, early on, I think it was either Eileen or Jim or maybe Bob were talking about, uh, or, or someone was talking about uh, mapping your systems. So we know what we have out there. And not only do we know what's out there, but we know where they're interconnected. Because I think that's the, the real problem we're having. Scott mentioned, you know, all these attacks that we're having uh, all the time. <clears throat> and what we have found in a couple of these things, and we can go back to the target uh, stores where the, the bad guys were able to get into the target system because they were able to get in through their building uh, uh, HVAC system. You know, that computer system and somehow and this is this what i'm talking about the mapping part of it somehow through that that uh hvac control system SCADA system they were able to get into targets business system and from there then they were able to steal information and, and other uh, personal information so 
it's that mapping piece that I want to make sure that we keep bringing to the forefront that we know where the where these connections are uh, so we know how someone may be get, may get into our system that we've never even thought of before so uh, that's the, the the main thing I want to throw out right now is uh, uh, is let's keep that in mind and I, I'm sure Jim when we break in our breakouts I think Jim's a breakout is uh, and that I'm on with him is the SCADA piece so something we want to make sure we we keep in the forefront of everybody we may secure our system uh, in ways you know all the ways that we can but we forgot about that one back door that's that's there but that someone else has access from whether it's HVAC or or whatever it happens to be so I just want to make sure we yeah, keep great. it on the forefront Clark. Great great point I mean I think it also echoes you know Chris's uh, commentaries about uh, you know, we got to assess, you know, it's just, this is a piece of the assessment process, but, you know, how do we know what to address if we don't have a comprehensive look at what the, the where everything knits together? Yeah, um, and where the vulnerabilities are. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Which, uh, again, I think that's one of the things that you're going to be taking up in the breakout groups, which we're just about to go to. I was going to skip ahead, but I just want to have one more kind of uh, opportunity for some of our core panelists, uh, Cheryl or, or Daniel or... Tari, uh, anybody that wants to to uh, make some kind of a final overview comments, and then we're going to move to breakout. You all good? You can't wait to get into breakout session. <laughs> uh, so, uh, Charlotte, if we could just move to the the um, the breakout. Um, yes, thank you. So uh, here's this is I think to me one of the more exciting things about doing. Uh, these seminars is, you know, we can we can kind of talk around a big table, but to actually, you know, come out of this intellectual process with ideas that, you know, could make, uh, could create the basis for, you know, a position paper or a manifesto or just an elevator speech about what we need to be worried about, thinking about, and changing. Uh, we we want to, you know, bring the conversation into a world uh, where there's action. Uh, so that's the concept behind uh, separating everybody, you know, in three groups. And uh, for each of these groups, there will be one of our subject matter experts, kind of according to the area of expertise that we, we heard presentations on, uh, one of our board members, and then our core participants. So uh, what uh, this, how this works, let me see what's the next, uh, slide here. How this works is uh, in the chat feature, don't go there now, but in the chat feature, there will be the three breakout groups, ransomware, uh, DDoS, and SCADA. And we're not looking for you to dwell on those particular attack vectors, except to the extent that they represent some unique challenges, but really as a group to, you know, think about what we just started doing, idea identification, a gap and need analysis, uh, how we can address and move forward, particularly now before there's a crisis, pre-incident planning. Uh, so again, it's kind of an idea lab. Among the core participants uh, who have been identified, and we're gonna share that list uh, shortly, uh, we'd like you to do the report outs and maybe just you know pick one or two of you from your group. There was about six or seven in each group. Uh, when we reconvene in plenary to talk us through uh, what your breakout group arrived at. So uh, let's look at the next slide. So I've, uh, I think the one, one before there, uh, Cheryl. So I framed these broadly uh, and, and I'm not saying that these are the questions you have to kind of, you know, be focused on. It's not a test, it's really uh, hearing from the professionals. Uh, but, you know, we are envisioning a, a much bigger role, even than the large role some of, of our GIS partners have in disaster response and recovery. Uh, so maybe some ideas about what that looks like. What, maybe a, a make it an, almost like a negative question. What aren't you being used for that you should be? Um, but I think that this next question and the, the third one are the really big ones. How do we preserve GIS functionality? I mean, what are the things that we could be doing? We've already talked about backup systems, access to data off the web. Um, and, uh, uh, but also, you know, the things that you, you need to do in order to uh, identify 
how to meet, meet those uh, functionality challenges. And then I, this is a big one for us, for our program is, what do we, what should we be working on right now? What's the pre-crisis uh, kind of scenario or, or set of propositions to maximize our GIS, GIS functionality in, in the event of a cyber attack or, or really any, any time that there is a, a, a stem winder of a, a disaster. So next slide, please. So here are the, uh, the core participants, the SME and the NAPSIC board members that I'd like to uh, have you select uh, when you go into chat, uh, these breakout groups that you are listed under. All right, so in the, the virtual COVID environment here, let's uh, let's go ahead and do a virtual handshake and a meet and greet of everyone that's uh, that's part of our discretion group here today that has uh, speaking rights. And Chris, I'll turn it over to you if you'd like to kick off. Sure, absolutely. Uh, welcome, everybody. Glad that you're uh, all here and interested. Uh, and we'll just get right into it. Um, I think uh, we can skip all of the introductions. There's too many people and not enough time. So let's just dive right in. Um, so I guess, you know, uh, let's cover what DDoS is just real quickly, maybe a 30 second to 60 second overview. So uh, distributed uh, denial of service attack. So DDoS is kind of a, is kind of an old and true, um, you know, hackers method to, uh, to really deny services is really what it's about. Uh, the threat of a DDoS is not that your systems are going to be attacked, um, but what it's doing is uh, the 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 um, the attacker is trying to de deny the services. They're trying to disrupt uh, the thing that it is that you're trying to access or the thing that you're trying to provide service to. So um, DDoS can be very disruptive, especially in the financial world. Um, but, um, but today, in today's day and age, DDoS is not as uh, prominent, mainly because it's more financially viable to do other methods such as ransomware uh, and with cloud technology and now with the onset of, of uh, container uh, technology spinning up services to meet that demand, uh, it's pretty difficult. But what happens in a DDoS attack? Uh, so just to let you guys know what a DDoS is, is the attacker will use what we call slave machines. They will use uh, malware to get on and infect a machine so they can take a machine over and use it as a base of operations uh, to shoot off uh, requests on a website, as an example. Uh, they will gain um, access to as many slave machines as they possibly can in terms of how many, it could be anywhere from hundreds to thousands and thousands and thousands of slave machines. And then they will receive a command from a command machine to attack a particular website. Uh, we'll just, you know, any website, right? And then that command is executed and those slave machines then go on and, and, and attack for a period of time. That is one methodology. That's an example of how it works. Uh, and so I guess as to set this up uh, from a GIS perspective, uh, how are you, what is the role of GIS in supporting response and recovery uh, efforts if your scenario of a DDoS attack on your environment um, is played out in, in, in a real world situation? Uh, let's just say there's a uh, earthquake or a hurricane or a tornado event and you're now all of a sudden responding and you find your systems under attack, a DDoS attack. So I'm gonna open it up to the panels, just kind of have a discussion about it, give me your thoughts. And then in maybe in about eight minutes here or so, we'll move on to question number two. Thoughts, anyone? Well, I, I think like I, I alluded to earlier, um, that plan B, right? A, a, and you're then going to have to segment your your capabilities. So, all right, I'm in the EOC. Do I have a, a, a machine that's that is independent, and can I then, you know, be able to continue supporting the operation uh, aside from not having any other of the other tools? Um, you know, do 
can can I bring uh, the? Do I have a laptop? Can I go and, and connect it directly to a printer um, or to a big screen? And so we're now where now we had all these toys in the EOC. We're now back to the, the way it used to be. You know, one big table with a map and and the folks around there. Um, so I think the like I said, as an as an IT professional uh, that focuses on GIS, the two need to go hand in hand and in, in, in that process um, of, of responding. And then what we were talking about earlier, pre-responding, right? So when I think uh, uh, the pandemic really, this COVID-19 deal did was, you know, in the early 2000s when, when we got all this grant money to create coup plans and what have you, um, a consultant came in and, and, and pandemic was probably on the list, but I bet if we all took those down off our shelves and looked at what we wrote, what got wrote there and what we've now done for the last year, they're not going to match. And I would say that's the same thing. We might have had cyber on there, but, you know, every 18 months, the, the, uh, the, the, the actors have new toys uh, and new ways of, of doing what they do. Uh, better than we can, um, and uh, have we? It's time to do a new threat ass assessment and and a new Thyra just specifically on that, and then look at ways we can uh, um, be better prepared. Hey, hey, Robert, this is Bob Stefan. I want to kind of slightly rephrase that first question to get more to the point there because I think it's a bit confusing, and and the rephrasing would be as follows. So, if you're in the middle of responding to an all hazards event from your EOC or, or another location, and you're providing key GIS functionality to the emergency managers uh, that are with you. Um, and now all of a sudden the DDoS attack happens and you're cut off from your, your IT systems that you normally use to provide that functionality. What are the key things that you absolutely have to find a way to back them up? Because those are the priority essential functions that you provide in that all hazard response environment. And I would say that, it, you know, having that data ahead of time and, and an independent machine, you know, that one laptop that's just, that's always there um, that can operate off the network, uh, you know, it, you've got a desktop license already on that, um, that you've taken offline uh, and, uh, and you're looking for those, those printers or those other devices, those other big screens that you might need to bring in. And now you're, you're now in one corner of the room providing that capability uh, instead of being in the center of the room and, and sharing it out. So I think that's, that's one of those things. Uh, I, we definitely could do our job uh, in, a, in, a, in a disconnected environment because if, if we're prepared to do so, and for so much of us, we now are so integrated into the web GIS comp, uh, way of doing things that uh, if we haven't also thought of that plan B, um, we're not going to be able to respond. If everything you do is is to the web and you have no way of doing anything outside the web, then then the the bad actors have succeeded in in disrupting the operation. Thoughts from anybody else on the panel for this question? I would tend to agree with that. I mean, I think we're lucky from where we're at uh, in Ohio, Wood County. Um, we are in the same building as GIS, and I know that they've got the paper stuff that we could go up and get. The challenge is going to be is it's not going to be accurate. It's not going to be up to date. Um, I know that they've got some, you know, we've got some different things that we might be able to use. You know, obviously, the backup might be interested, something of interest that we could get to, but um, we had a neighboring county that got hit and virtually all their backups were useless. So, I, I mean, I think it kind of in the, the role of what everybody's saying is, is the reality is, yeah, you're going to have to have the paper backup. You're going to kind of have to have a plan B and more importantly, with just a plan B, people are going to have to know how to use it, where to get the information and so forth. And how, the next question, next challenge is going to be is how do we relay that um, to the scene to get them information that they're going to need on that one. No, that's good. Excellent. Um, other panelists, 
thoughts, ideas, any additions? Um, and, and I guess maybe what, I, what we should do here is I, I realize that some of our, and I'm, I'm kind of doing an audible here. I realize that some of our answers uh, may be answering question two and three already, which is good. I don't have a problem with that. So let's just look at the context of all three questions as the whole conversation. Originally, I was thinking, well, we'd answer question number one and question number two, but right away we jumped into sort of answering questions across the gamut. So let's just leave it at that. Uh, let's continue the conversation about things that we've been talking about already. So uh, you have online systems, you're using online systems. Um, let's talk a little bit about how do we mitigate and work around that stuff. Now we talked about having independent systems, having the hardware there and having the data. Those are just two components. What other, what are the things that need to be done uh, if you have that independent system available and the data available? Thoughts? Uh, Jen from Virginia, I think you had a, a, a hand up or a chat comment if you'd like to elaborate. Can you hear me? Yes. All right. So I was, um, as a fellow um, emergency management GISer, um, we always have to uh, think about, I'm on the state level as well, but what happens when our redundant systems no longer function? Um, and Unfortunately, <laughs> our newest plotters, which are awesome and big, require a network to print to. So that would be us bringing in our search and rescue personnel who have 24 inch plotters that we can direct connect to and, and print directly off of. But the whole um, setting up a, a process to automatically back up offline data so that, so we live in an Esri hosted SOC 2 environment. We have to have internet connection to get to our data. Um, so ensuring that we have um, scripting processes that run that can back up that data to somewhere so that we can use it when we don't have access. The only bad part is our data centers also live off, off campus. So that's us making copies onto an external hard drive like, hey guys, every Friday morning at 10 a.m., this is what I want you to do. This is your process. And practicing those and also um, working with your we have a, a training education and exercise division working with your RT division and setting up those exercises of your dark scenarios. If you don't practice them, you won't do them and you won't remember how to do them. Yeah, I think that's a really good point, Jen. Um, and somebody was asking that question in, in the previous uh, Zoom session when everyone was together in one of the Q&A and I, uh, answered the anonymous person uh, by just saying you've, you've got to be able to uh, assess the situation, uh, run a tabletop uh, plan and make the adjustments and then run, run the exercise to see what falls out. Uh, I think that's an important step forward. So I think you're right on, Jen, by uh, that all this, we can do all the things that we want. We can have the data, we can have the equipment, but if you know, if we're denied, you know, the, the access that we normally have and we're not training the way that we fight, then we have a problem. And now we're trying to train during the fight and that's not good. So I think Jen, you're right on the point there. Uh, Dave Jones, you, you had a, a chat comment. Would you like to elaborate? Oh, hi. Um, sure. I'm Dave Jones uh, with uh, Storm Center Communications. Um, we, the thought that I had is that if you're if you're doing distributed data access uh, from multiple servers or multiple trusted partners, uh, people who are providing critical, let's say, feature services or data services, uh, you could have that critical infrastructure data residing locally as well, and just have a different address that you go to if you want to keep people on the same map at the same time, sharing that information locally. Um, so you could uh, perhaps. Uh, be better situated to address a denial of service attack. Yeah, Dave, I think that's also an uh, answer uh, to the situation is, is at least from an online perspective. Um, if many of us are using ArcGIS Online, um, we know that, that ArcGIS Online is built on the AWS system and the AWS cloud has the ability to handle those DDoS. But in a massive event, 
you know, or let's say you're hosting your own ArcGIS online site as in ArcGIS uh, enterprise or portal, portal. Um, and you've got your single server, what happens if that single server goes down? What is your backup? I think Dave, that, uh, that is a great, great point. Um, and, uh, and having your system duplicated elsewhere so that you can bring that online very, very quickly and operate in the same fashion. Good, good point. Tommy, I see you got nine minutes. What does that mean? What does the nine minutes do? Uh, just uh, until we return to the main session. Excellent. I just wanted to know to what that was. So, all right. Thank you very much. Appreciate I just, it. I thought they'd keep everybody on track for you. <laughs> no, that's great. I appreciate it. Uh, Dave, anything? Go ahead. No, I was going to say, Dave, anything else that you wanted to add to that? Because I think that was a great comment. Um, no, just just that as uh, technology evolves and, you know, we're able to keep people on the same map at the same time, looking at the same data, no matter what platform they're using, uh, the data services that you pull from need to come from trusted curators. And uh, the comment that was made yesterday from Tom Moran at the All Hazards Consortium, um, I've been a part of evolving those operational readiness levels for data. So uh, something that I took a note on that could go into the definition of those operational readiness levels uh, could be your ability to back up and serve that data locally if you get hit with a, a denial of service. Thanks. Hey, Chris, can I pose a question to you in the group? So based upon my, my presentation and my experience, this, uh, this infrastructure and cyber physical systems mapping is, is a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it's absolutely critical so that you know what's what, what's, what's priority, what is gonna cascadingly fail in what sequence, and then how do you reverse engineer that for restoration uh, kind of architecture? But my question is, the other side of that coin is, um, you're amassing an incredible amount of very sensitive data that if those groups that I talked about that are doing critical infrastructure mapping on their own to get to us and, and examine our vulnerabilities, that means that you guys have to do like uh, time and a half to, to try to protect that data set or those data sets on a daily basis. What's your sense for how that's going? And could you guys recommend any solutions to that protection of data problem that might be out there? Well, I mean, that's sort of an age old question. It's been around for quite a long time. Uh, the Federal Geographic Data Committee, FGDC, put out uh, some documentation, um, I don't know, 15 years ago or more on uh, taking data and moving and determining whether that data should be made publicly available. It's an entire uh, workflow uh, document that allows you to answer a series of questions. They have a, a spreadsheet, uh, Excel spreadsheet that allows you to fill up the answers uh, to the questions. And at the bottom, you know, it, it sort of is this uh, sort of this recipe book that says whether that data should be made available or not. Now that's sort of the old school before ArcGIS Online was, was available. Things are much more prevalent. Um, I would think that a lot of that still would be available. I just don't know uh, in today's day and age how that would, would apply very well. And it's very possible that needs to be through the FGDC be refreshed to take in the concepts of, of online access. So I think your point is well taken. And, and Bob, I, I like your I like the question because you're right. We've now got this document that's like here's here's all all the things that are connected. And if they actually got a hold of that document, now they have the roadmap, right? <laughs> and right. it's like hey, and so I think that was that piece of the question that the, uh, um, and that's that's like uh, tough, right? Do you like do it, print it, and then delete the digital copy so it's only on paper, um, and then that you know I don't know. Uh, but I think going back to another, another piece of this is like having that one laptop that's got all the data and if need be another laptop that can act as a server, right? So you've got, you, you know, you've kind of got a, a mini, mini LAN set up if you needed to, to do work. I don't think a lot of uh, jurisdictions have considered that to be kind of a necessary part of, of, uh, their redundancy. They just think, hey, I, you know, I'll, I'll I'll be able to like get get up, get spun up, uh, or I can work independently. And some may can, and some won't be. I'm reminded of back in Katrina, where 
you know, the, the, the IT GIS manager uh, just kind of got this feeling and decided to pull the hard drives out of his servers um, that had all his asset management data and everything that they needed. Um, and, you know, cause the building wasn't supposed to flood, <laughs> and, but somehow he, 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 he pulled that and, and that became a huge piece for that, that jurisdiction, you know, to, because they had an asset management system and they had all their infrastructure that they could, you know, be back up and running and, 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 and that. So I think that's that other piece that a lot of folks, it's like, oh yeah, I'm, I'll be good. And, and not make me think of uh, the unexpected that way. And that's how we've had it need to prepare and mitigate. Yeah. Good, good question. Good answer. Anybody else on the panel that, that uh, would like to, we only have about three and a half minutes. Is there anybody else that has anything else they would like to add or, or offer um, to these questions? They're very important questions. Um, and you know, a lot of the times we think about uh, these things in terms of data, um, but a lot of, a lot of this is really about technology, right? How do we secure our technology? It's really about the data. I think, I think, you know, Bob, that's what you're talking about is securing the data. But yeah. in order to secure the data, you have to take care of the technology. And so that's sort of the key thing here is how do we, how do we put in, you know, workflows? How do we put in processes uh, to shore up our systems, application, software, operating system, network, et cetera, et cetera, so that the data doesn't get exposed when it's not, not supposed to be. And I think that's what you're kind of alluding to. Uh, yeah, because I got I found out a hard lesson in that you know ten years ago in DHS I started an initiative to take a look at the overseas uh, infrastructure dependencies. What were the key supply chain choke points across all the critical infrastructures that had an overseas origin? And we put that at the top secret level, and uh, one of our interagency partners in the federal government made a unilateral decision to downgrade it to secret and they didn't have that classification authority. And then that package, that whole package of research that we did that identified about 600 critical things overseas ended up on the WikiLeaks yeah. data set and exposed to, to, to anyone, anybody that could get it. So never, never be in that position. And, and my lesson learned was we had the tightest security possible. And then one of our key federal partners that we were connected to blew it. And that was the that was the link that that allowed um, malicious actors to get a hold of that information. It was the partners that we were connected to that that didn't have the safeguards in place that we needed. And our system was they became our weakest link. And I think that's not always going to be true. That you know, our vendors that we relate to, our third party, even you know, our business partner, as we business partners that are bringing in those those other systems that we rely on they right. those are that piece, that's that piece that um a lot of it professionals during that that vetting process of a when you're choosing the solution you know what looking at them as an organization of uh, you know do you what are your your the pieces that, that this system gives that uh, taking it uh, take into account uh, cyber cyber stuff and and those IT pieces and I think uh, you know that's the one thing that a lot of state and and local governments don't really have is they don't have a compartmentalized deal right there's public and there's non-public and and that's and that's about the only thing um, so. Uh, it becomes really, uh, really tough on. Uh, All right, we're, we're kind of running out of time here. I want to summarize some of the things we've talked about here. Uh, the last thing Dave had put into text has alluded to a lot of the things we're talking about showing up at the EOC. Is that realistic as, as an example? I think the answer is yes. We do that in the state of Wisconsin. Um, we tabletop uh, dark sky events if the internet goes out. Uh, that's a different type of denial of service, but it is a denial of service. I think to Jen's point, uh, train, train, train. Uh, we have to know and assess and putting things together is an, a, a, an important component. I think uh, somebody mentioned about having uh, different systems. We talked about having 
uh, maybe just this, uh, um, a separate local area network uh, where you can work inside this trusted in, uh, zero trust or, or trusted environment. Uh, or, you know, zero trust being we don't trust anybody else, but anybody on that network um, and having a standalone system or standalone computer with data. Uh, and then also somebody mentioned having, you know, a secondary site. So you've got your main website. If that gets ha hacked or not hacked, but gets attacked, uh, send everybody over to this other website that is separate from that one. So that uh, that could be also uh, a way out of that. So. Uh, I don't have all of that. Uh, I didn't say everything that I took notes on, but that's in a nutshell uh, the notes that I have here and discussion that we that we have come up with. Um, I'll eventually type these things up and get them shared out. I don't know how we ull how we'll get them to you, but um, I want to thank you for your time. I want to thank you for your uh, participation, your feedback. This has been excellent. Uh, you guys are all on point. Um, yeah, I think the next thing is in, in getting this feedback, and this is probably to uh, Clark's point uh, earlier is how does NAPTA get involved? And I think there, as, as a board member, I think it's important for me to help guide uh, NAPTA in the direction that this is an important topic. And we as an organization need to providing all of you with uh, training opportunities, uh, learning opportunities, and, 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 you know, other examples in which we can help you move forward um, and, and do it as painless as possible. So there's a role to play here for NAPSEG. I just, uh, you know, we'll have Peter O'Rourke and, uh, and his staff along with, um, with Tommy Hicks, who's on the line right here, to help figure that out and how to make it fit in uh, with the sort of the NAPSEG model. So Tommy, uh, I don't know how we're doing on time, but uh, I think it's about time. Is that about right? Yes, sir. Y'all spot on. Really appreciate the kind of the sidebar dialogue that we've had in the breakout. Uh, Great. Thank you. I hope everybody's doing well. Uh, so, uh, by the way, are there, um, Peter, I see you here. Are there other lead panelists or board members? from NAPSEC and okay so uh why don't we dig in we have let's see about a half hour or so um to have a conversation uh who will do the report back Peter are you willing to do that I heard you somewhat volunteered <laughs> <laughs> yeah I can do it no worries okay terrific uh that's very, very nice of you. Uh, I don't want to preclude anyone else who wants to, to join, um, but uh, heard your name called out, so I thought it would be good. Uh, Peter, given that, um, is there a partner here you have from uh, the board or from... I'm happy to lead the conversation, yes. but, uh, oh, Daniel, I see you. I apologize, I didn't uh, see you earlier. Yeah, we do, why don't we do an East Coast, West Coast, and uh, me and Daniel will uh, lead up if he's all right with that. Sure. Do you talk to just uh, leading leading questions in the discussion, or how do you want to roll with that? That'd be great, and you'll do the report out to the main group, okay? Lovely. All right, I'll turn it over to both of you, but I'm here to uh, help facilitate. Do you have the questions? First yeah. one they're up on the screen um, and everybody can talk, right? So this is an, an open meeting, not just uh, like it was where panelists can talk. Exactly, everybody should be able to control their own microphone and, and participate and add your thoughts. Perfect, okay, well, I'll, um, I'll pose the first question, Daniel, if you don't mind. Um, so the first question is, what is the role of GIS in supporting response and recovery efforts to each of these scenarios? So I guess it's ransomware, right? So what would be the response of GIS in response and recovery of ransomware? Or is there any? You know, it's interesting, Peter. I, I did a little bit of research ahead of time before hopping on the, the meeting today to our uh, operations folks to ask, hey, what would we be doing for the GIS aspects of a ransomware thing. And honestly, I'm not quite sure. 
I mean, I'm okay to say I don't know because really in the instance of, you know, and talking once again at the state level, it was a localized event and there really wasn't much that we had to deal with as far as the GIS perspective in either responding to that event. I, I think the, the main issues that we had was really communications with the local jurisdiction that was impacted by this. But I, yeah, I'm not quite sure. I mean, some things that I wrote down were, well, we could help you know map the, the critical facilities that are impacted by that. Uh, but outside of that, it's, it was mostly like a law enforcement slash cybersecurity slash enterprise services at the local level that dealt with that particular event as opposed to state really di diving in on it. I mean, State Time Fusion Center was involved, of course, but outside of that, from a state emergency management perspective uh, for GIS, I, I didn't see much that we did as a part of that. Yeah, I don't, I don't necessarily think GIS is a target for ransomware. I just think they're, they're like uh, friendly fire, basically, yeah. in a ransomware incident. I mean, I, like I said earlier, I was in, working in Baltimore when, uh, with the fire department when we got hit by ransomware. And there was nothing you could really do. Like, it came through another agency, but because we were all on a shared network, it affected the entire network. And it affected everything from um, station computers to um, our IT computers to our IT servers, and nobody really knew what was going on. And, and I think this question of response and recovery is really in the wrong place. Like it shouldn't be response and recovery. Um, there really is no response for GIS in, in a ransomware incident, in my opinion. What you could be doing is in the, in the emergency management cycle, you could be doing the training and the preparedness because the response is out of your hands. It's, it's gonna be your county leadership or your, um, or your IT department responding to the um, to the malware and or the ransomware and getting you back up to speed. But if you have the preparedness and the training aspect before the response, before the emergency, you may have developed a continuity of business plan that has your data offsite, maybe at the state level, like we talked, like I mentioned with. Next Gen 911, or maybe even with another local jurisdiction that you neighbor with that, hey, I'll, I'll have a copy of your data, you have a copy of my data, or even what Chris says that you have an, a server that's not connected, that you just back up every now and then, and then you take it off the network, that it's not even um, remotely possible that it could be affected in ransomware. So I almost think like it's in the pre-response or pre-incident planning that you you need to prepare for this and then if you do that recovery is going to take care of itself yeah eileen uh, I, i'm an interloper here oh hi uh, Hi, clark didn't know you joined um yeah i think peter i think and, you've a short peter straw. Dan, sorry peter and daniel agreed to be the co-leads by the way oh, great great well i mean I, I was wondering you know listening to to i mean i Kind of agreed with with uh, the the general concept there, but I mean, I, what, in your experience, I mean, has have you seen a GIS role that maybe we haven't identified or appreciated? You know, in in say the ransomware side. So, uh, you know, I think Peter um, really articulated it well. It really is long before the attack happens, right? Um, to not just map out the systems and understand and prepare, um, but also I, I think there is a role in, in translating, being sure everybody understands when an attack happens, uh, the, the cascading impact, how, how the impacts can happen. There's not like a real uh, response uh, for them, I, I believe, uh, but I'd be interested in hearing from other people um, who are in the group because everybody does control their microphones and. I really encourage other folks who had other experiences. I do think Peter articulated it well in terms of the training, the preparedness, uh, 
ensuring that the systems are mapped out, that the policy decision makers, the, the folks who in the crisis are gonna be making decisions have good and accurate information about uh, the interconnectedness uh, that, that we've talked about all throughout. But I would really welcome other people opening their microphones and let me see if I can see if anybody's opening their mics would like to add and contribute to that. Hey, uh, Kevin, can we go to panelist view? I think we, we know the question now. I would just say one of the things for, for me is um, at this point, a lot of information sharing with some of the people who have been impacted by this, just to understand uh, what, what, what's, what's been impacted in their operations. Um, and then also with IT or GIS or whoever is sort of the, the holder of the data uh, for status updates as to uh, whether backups are available, if they've made any progress, uh, and then sort of the third leg of it is the investigative leg, trying to find out uh, from um, whoever's involved in the investigation as to uh, what the status is, if there's things that we are not allowed to use now because uh, they're, they're doing some sort of um, work on the data. Um, information sharing is going to be key at this point just to, to stay on top of what's going on. And a good incident management structure will assist with that. A little bit of that broad situation awareness you've identified, Ken, what, what are your key essential elements of information? And sorry if I'm throwing out a lot of EEI terms out here, but uh, it's all it's all revolved around that. You know, I mentioned earlier identification of critical facilities that are impacted. Similar case, you run through the planning cycle. You've identified what the hazard is. Based upon that hazard, what are the key essential elements of information that you need to have status reports on? and then delegating that out to responsible agencies. Uh, I know for us, one of the big advancements that we've made recently has been a total adjustment on our emergency operations plan, which should be adopted later on this year because we're due for adoption again. And we actually have a cyber ESF now that is led by enterprise information services uh, through our Department of Administrative Services. So kind of, I'm not quite sure what all that's going to look like yet, uh, but having kind of a, a prioritization of that particular key element, cyber is involved in everything, right? It's regardless of what type of disaster is, uh, but further highlighting that, yes, this is a key function of emergency operations and taking that into account and pulling in and identifying what are the key partners that we need to be able to pull in to address that particular sector. Terrific. Are there other uh, are there other folks uh, who joined uh, now that we can see everybody in panel view? Thank you for that, by the way. Um, any other uh, folks who'd like to add their thoughts on this item? Or Peter, would you like to um, address as well, uh, since you talked about uh, the role before? <laughs> the could you show Could you show the the question again? Sorry. This is kind of off off list. Um, <laughs> which we are allowed to do, uh, but since you brought up uh, the, the role of GIS before an event, uh, would you like to um, have a discussion on that as well of uh, how you think the preparedness aspect um, can be, can be uh, uh, really fortified and, and uh, complete? Yeah, well, um, yeah, I think, I think like what I said before about authoritative data, I think I think you need to identify the core GIS layers that you need on hand to, um, to
Scott, what do you think so far? Ah, pretty interesting stuff. Um, <clears throat> I, I keep trying to go back to think like, okay, what would happen uh, to my setup if, uh, you know, there was a um, cyber uh, attack or um, whatever. And yeah, it's kind of like, uh, okay, can I get just like, you know, a laptop and a hard drive that has a backup and just you know, keep going kind of in the corner of the, uh, you know, room somewhere, you know, outside of the internet. I, Cause I, I was asking some of the, the wizards here, if there's a, a way to like, uh, you know, if you're, if you're active, is there a way to cash somehow what what you're actually working on processing etc um and he said one of the things that uh, folks had done here in la was um some of the, the gis folks would only publish view on, publish view only uh information and information that couldn't be edited it, it could be edited but it was it was separate from the view only so that at least you had the most recent that was you know kind of frozen in time because it was view only it had a view only capability mm -hmm. so. uh, uh, one thing i'm looking at right now is trying to see about getting a uh cloud-based gis installed to share for um all the state agencies involved in emergency operations uh in the event that you know the main data center goes down Um, the thing that always uh, is tricky is like it's fine for going state agency to state agency, but then when you, it's a little easier, or, or I should say a little easier, a little less easy to uh, get stuff going up and down to uh, county folks, but trying to go up to the federal level and with uh, a secure data set uh that's where i keep running into problems so, so you know i mean maybe to go up but for them to come down i don't i don't know do you always want or need the federal you know download uh or you're yeah, just talking it, gen generic open source stuff or or secure data well, uh, with our situation, uh, I, I work pretty closely with our region two, uh, jazz coordinator. Um, and we've had discussions before where she's just like, something happens where we're pulled in. I'm asking you for data because I know it's better than the stuff we have. That's on the federal nationwide data set. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 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 Yeah, she said, uh, yeah, when she had the um, Maria down in Puerto Rico, which was part of region two, uh, they went down there and she said the lifesaver was got on the plane with a, uh, you know, couple terabyte hard drive that had all the data they needed and because they were working on their own with uh, no access to anything. Apologies for the dog. I think the mail's here. <laughs> okay. Uh, Rand, you good? Yes, I'm here. Okay. Um, let's see. Uh, Jonathan, Samantha, Amy, Kirk, and Cece. Uh, I'm Jim. If you... Uh, and I've been yammering away for off and on for like the last uh, couple of hours here. Um, I guess we what we should probably do is look at these three questions and uh, see what you guys have to say about you know the role of GIS uh, in this you know the scenario relative scenarios. What are the key uh, mitigations and workarounds to preserve GIS functionality? And uh, Scott and I were just kind of talking about that. And uh, what should be, what should we be working on pre-crisis to maximize GIS functionality and support to jurisdictions confronting a cyber attack? 
So where do we want to start? Okay. Uh, for me, uh, I hear of a SCADA impact that uh, leads me to deal with uh, critical infrastructure, which is one of the main data sets that I work with you know, on a daily basis. Um, and it, it really depends on what happened you know, in, in the attack. You know, was it just they, they take uh, control of the things and try to turn some valves or something like uh, we had that happen in New Jersey and they tried turning some valves that hadn't been exercised in 40 years. So nothing happened. Um, but uh, I'm sure folks that have a uh, newer infrastructure uh, might not have that easy way out. Um, yeah. Is, is it, something like that like uh where they're talking about earlier uh you know someone just trying to see what they can do versus a coordinated attack from uh you know a uh, state-sponsored agency or something like that yeah i was i just when you i wrote down the, what happened and what's the impact the uh the airport here uh prides itself on you know it's, it has a distributed fuel system that runs all the way to the port of LA. Uh, and we reminded them that the valving and the pumps for the port were all computer controlled with a, a centralized system. So this, this, decentralized, this decentralized jet fuel capability, which they figured they will, we'll never run out of fuel, even if there is a, an, on, an on-site attack. You know, we, the fuel farms here can always be brought back up to speed. I said, yeah, but you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be a dirty hands terrorist. It could be a nimble fingers terrorist that shuts down the computer control valving and pumping that brings in, I guess, tens of thousands of gallons of jet fuel every hour to like the fifth busiest airport in the world. So the, uh, I, I don't think that the average person realizes how, how many SCADA are involved in their daily lives or as in the previous conversation that at least uh, I think three of us were involved in, how interconnected they are. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, and you, you think about um, just a simple system in a neighborhood or those kind of things even all of the, the lift stations, the sewage lift stations, all those kind of things are controlled by SCADA. So it doesn't have to be an attack that, you know, is going to destroy whatever or steal, you know, uh, billions or trillions of dollars. It could be an attack, something as, it's not simple, but as simple as wiping out all the lift stations in a, in a town or a county or a city or whatever the jurisdiction is, could create all kinds of havoc, uh, which may be a, uh, you know, may uh, be a, uh, a distraction for some other kind of event that's about to happen or is happening at the same time. So, you know, those kind of things. And I think to the question, I believe we're, that we're looking at, what's the role of GIS in supporting response and recovery efforts to each of, to that kind of a scenario or these other scenarios would be on a widespread basis like that. If, if um, before the event, GIS data had been gathered, so you know where all those list stations are, you know, those kind of things, that might be a one way the GIS supports response and recovery uh, for, mm -hmm. for some widespread event like that. So, you know, just off the top of my head, something to, to think about. Yeah. yeah. And you know where the interconnects are or whatever for, you know, a pressurized water system, you know, sure. then you can try to alleviate, you know, lower pressure or whatever by knowing where the, what the system is and how it's uh, arranged. Cool. Um, so I wrote down no and or map the systems and their in, and their interconnectivity. You know, I mean, it, it sounds simple um, and, and it could be depending on how much documentation was kept as the systems were developed and, and brought online uh, or it could be a, a, a serious detective mission to, to go back and, and see, you know, 
where do these, what do these systems look like and, and do they actually touch each other? Like you said, you were talking about the, uh, uh, the aged uh, uh, valving. I mean, I think more recent or, or the newer systems, there's, there's documentation that, that makes the mapping or knowing uh, the system and where it touches a, a lot easier. But some of the, you know, you know a lot of the, the, uh, the bigger, more complex jurisdictions in this country, you know, are pretty old, pretty old. And it, it's just like, uh, you know, that, that house where the, these additions were put on, you know, with, with no or, or, or limited, uh, you know, drawings or plans. And uh, yeah, so I, there may be some surprises. I, I worked on plans where they, they, this was up in Massachusetts. There was a, one of the main aqueduct lines was a hollowed out tree. <laughs> and like, wait, how long is it? Yeah, that's been there a hundred years and they haven't replaced it yet. <laughs> Yeah, that's kind of, you know, it's, it ain't broke. We still have clay water mains in the southern part of L.A. And on the west side, we still have um, uh, cast iron uh, riveted mains. So. Oh, okay. Most older cities definitely have that. Yeah, um, uh, that, that, that was actually a problem I, I had before with uh, um, cities in New Jersey where they would have the plan and they would get the plan digitized and it doesn't matter because that plan was 30 years out of date when they digitized it. And when they open up the street, that's not what's going on. Uh, question two, uh, what what are the key mitigations and workarounds to preserve GIS functionality when a jurisdiction loses its data and IT functionality? Jim, I, we haven't heard from uh, some of the other folks here. Um, Jonathan, Samantha, uh, Kirk, you guys have any, uh, any thoughts on this? This is Terry. I can pipe in for a second. Um, when I was a local, we had, um, and I can't remember, it was like a, I know I'm going to say the wrong term, but we had an inf uh, like a REM bot or some kind of worm that in fact got, got through from the state health department. And that's how we figured out our locals were all infected by this virus type situation. And so in order to figure out who had gotten um, infected, they cut down our networks. So everyone was working in silos. And up until that point, we had all been um, advised to keep everything in the cloud because that's backed up. Don't keep things locally, but you know, keep all of your data on our, net, our network shared drives. And when that happened, a lot of us were just um, SOL. <laughs> we, we couldn't do the work that we needed to. So thinking about this prior to something like that, um, if we had had copies local, not everything, but the critical stuff, what is the critical things that you knew, need to do in your, your day to day um, and during a disaster and having those things locally um, was a big deal and not some, and we were in emergency management and we had not thought about the IT side of things, right? We had coup plans for where to evacuate, but we had not thought through what happens if we can't hit our, you know, our network databases where we're keeping all of our plans and all of our data. So in one of the mitigations is to think about what those, you know, critical roles and responsibilities you have in your department um, as a GIS analyst um, and making sure that you can do that, you know, without your, your typical networks and your typical, you know, uh, systems that you rely on on a daily basis can you work within your own environment so that's one thing that we learned kind of the hard way so here, so here's a question um is there a process or what what, what would be the thought process terry it, to because everything everything is critical but everything can't be critical so how how do you how do you prioritize I know going back to my firefighter days, it was always life safety, incident stabilization, preservation of property, you know. So in the, in the GIS world, how, how do you prioritize um, what's, what's, what, what, are your, what are your critical functions? 
Yeah, it, that's a tough one. And it's one that's going to vary by, you know, what your roles and responsibilities are and what your department really thinks are the priorities too. And it may not be what you think are your priorities. So um, we had these coup plan documents, right? They're like fancy spreadsheets, Adobe, you know, PDF forms that we would fill out. And they were never at that time, they weren't really um, for IT type folks. So we had to customize it for us, right? So we had to capture, you know, do you have your licenses for all the, uh, the software that you need to, to access? Do you have your customer identification number? Do you have the support number? Simple things like that, that you don't think that you need to, you know, you don't need anymore because they're just stored somewhere on the network. Um, so going through that process, I think, and then working with your leadership is really important because, you know, you know what you do on a daily basis, but your leaders may not know that, you know, all the things you do day to day to keep all those things functioning. So I think, unfortunately, I don't think there's a straight answer, at least in my, yeah. you know, perspective for, it. I think it's a case by case basis. Yeah, it, it, it's probably, a. a a moving target, but but I, but I would submit that it needs to be part of your your routine. Your, your your maintenance may not necessarily be actually touching things. Your maintenance might be just okay. What's the thought process? You know, because your priorities may change depending on what's happening in your jurisdiction, your company, your your department. Your your priorities may change literally from day to day, or you know, at least you know, week or month to month. Yeah, I think that's where, uh, you know, having your disaster recovery plan, you know, and making it and putting it on the shelf and never looking at it again, that's the problem. You got to exercise it, you know, at least once a year, go through it, make sure everything's still valid and pertinent. Uh, the last time my office went through the plan, like I didn't find out about it till afterwards. I'm like, hmm, yeah, they never asked me about any of my stuff. <laughs> Was a, 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 a posted on my desk was something Craig Fugate said years ago. He says, uh, "People in disasters never follow the plan, <laughs> especially when politicians are involved." Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, what should we be working on pre-crisis? I'm sorry. Anybody else have anything to add to uh, question number two? Okay. Uh, for for us, um, we uh, work uh, almost exclusively in the cloud using uh, Microsoft 365, and uh, we use the you know we do uh, have our OneDrive uh, um, um, moving uh, data over to our desktops. But uh, that can happen uh, very quickly. So I've been looking at uh, of, of having a, uh, a longer a way, uh, more or less uh, creating uh, restore points in our data uh, using uh, uh, network storage devices, possibly, so that uh, even though that the cloud information tends to update very quickly, um, to be able to have a... a, a, a several set points that we could uh, restore if needed. And uh, also, uh, um, I'm looking at a few options for air, air gapping uh, 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 so some of our GSI uh, functionality, which is very lim minimal to begin with, but uh, so that we could actually operate uh, offline with uh, no connection. And uh, um, but I think my biggest question is uh, the best way to achieve this, uh, the, uh, the restore points and data. Okay. So you, you were saying, so you primarily, uh, you and your folks use, uh, use the cloud right now. I was trying to remember, I, I couldn't uh, scribble fast enough. You said you're looking at something, um, a capability it would actually uh, help you with restoration. Yes, and that would that would uh, be simply using a uh, NAS to do a backup of the uh, 
of the uh, OneDrive uh, folders on the desktop. So, so it'd almost be like a shock absorber, you know, if, if there was a hit, and, and then this would actually uh, be able to fill in um, and bring things back up uh, a little quicker. Uh, yeah, yes, because you would just set the NAS so that it uh, would not that uh, uh, corrupt the data cannot overwrite good data. You would simply have a a, a good restore point, you know, data restore point. Good, cool, good stuff. Kirk, the uh, system that you have, as you mentioned, you you uh, you know download things from uh, the Microsoft Cloud essentially. Um, is there any? Uh, does that come directly to your servers, or is there some intermediary? I don't know exactly what your setup is. Is there some other IT section that handles that before it gets to you, or how is that set up for you? Um, so uh, React has a a, um, a umbrella. I'm going to call it uh, account, and then uh, people such as myself uh, and other people who a uh, limited number of people also have their own accounts. And so all that information is backed up in the uh, main Microsoft, but also for each individual account, uh, that information generally gets backed up to our own uh, desktops or laptop or whatever we may be using. So you wouldn't need to rely on someone in a different section of your organization? No, no, it's done uh, automatically, okay. uh, as I have it set up anyways. But that eliminates one choke, choke point then. Right. The, the problem is, is that the, uh, you know, as uh, uh, files are changed in the cloud, they are very quickly updated on the desktop. And so if the information becomes corrupted, then you could have uh, no, uh, no good backup of the information. And so that's uh, why uh, the thought of uh, doing uh, intermittent backups uh, to a network storage device. Good. And I would assume that would probably work for many county EOCs and so forth, depending on how they store their data, if they store it. Well, uh, Terry mentioned that they are in the cloud. Yeah, I was going to echo what you said is exactly what we put in place after the fact. Um, and, and it was our county uh, emergency management um, agency. And then I moved to a municipality after that. And uh, it wasn't until um, I start, I lost some data that I found out that all of the other servers that in our IT department, which I was in, was getting backed up and not the GIS server. And uh, sometimes you just have to speak up and not assume that your servers and your data are getting backed up because sometimes GIS is just overlooked. It's just a thing that is just working on its own. So um, it, it, luckily it wasn't a big deal, but um, yeah, it helps to speak up and double check those things. And how often are they backed up? And is that frequency good with your, your data updates? Terry, Ter, you're overlooked until somebody wants a map. <laughs> oh, for sure. Well, thanks to everybody for participating in that. I, I'm beginning to become a fan of the the breakout approach because it becomes you know a little more uh, it's an opportunity to focus uh, conversation and and then bring something back to the larger group based on you know a collective effort and insights and sharing information. Um, I, I'm, I'm before we start that process, we're just going to do you know brief reports out from uh, the folks that have been designated from each of the breakout groups. Uh, and uh, then we'll do some concluding comments and, and uh, thank everybody for your participation. But one thing I, I would definitely like to, to you know, tee up right at the outset is, uh, as many of us have often said about GIS, 
and its role in the world. Uh, that when you think about it, everything that has, can, and will happen occurs in a place and against and in, and in a time. I mean, which really to me summarizes what the GIS capability is, uh, you know, in, in a broad stroke. And uh, that seems to be an almost unlimited palette. You know, when I think of my own profession in policing, uh, place becomes so determinative of really every aspect of deploying and responding and, and uh, helping uh, uh, whoever is in need. Uh, you know, and, and when we start really triangulating on the frequencies and the patterns and the access and egress and, and all that stuff, I mean, that's, that's to me a lot about GIS. And the more we can unravel that way, uh, the better and better we can be at, 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 uh, at helping, really. Um, and I, I know this, these questions uh, are in, against the backdrop of some pretty dire sort of, of uh, scenarios uh, that uh, probably you know, impact GIS as much, if not more, than most other sectors of, of, the, of the response and recovery community, the preparedness response and recovery community because your, your data is taken away. And as we talked earlier, yeah, we, we can access GIS uh, capabilities outside of an affected area. Um, although many GIS you know, uh, systems are linked into you know, particular jurisdictions, uh, but you can kind of work around that, but you don't have access to the data that you need in order to the city data or the county data that you need to analyze, that you need to provide the support uh, uh, of GIS to. So uh, again, uh, really looking forward to you know the, re the report out. So let's put up the uh, next slide to orient everybody. So again, I'm not wedded entirely to these questions, although in the breakout group I attended on ransomware with Eileen uh, and Justin, uh, there was a real attempt made to, to, uh, to um, you know, kind of respond to the specific questions. But, you know, really, I'm, I think for our purposes, very interested in what can we be doing, you know, more, better, or originally, uh, uh, you know, for the first time that will help us uh, and, and jurisdictions uh, through GIS service and support. Um, so it looks like uh, our first group is uh, DDoS. Uh, I don't know, Bob, you wanna tee that up and uh, hear from your uh, participants? Yeah, thank you very much, Clark. We had a great discussion. Uh, it began with the DDoS uh, summary to kind of talk about the threat vector and the threat actors that could perpetrate such, uh, such an approach, but then we quickly migrated it to be more general in terms of the cyber piece. We talked about, I'll uh, reinforce the uh, the importance of the mapping piece up front um, to understand where the key functionality provided by GIS, GIS systems and assets really needs to, to come to play and, and what things, what functionality needs to be uh, protected and preserved. I think with that brief intro, I'd like to turn it over to Chris Diller, if, if I could, Chris, to ask you to walk through your, your notes that you took there on the mitigation pieces. Yeah, yeah, thank you, Bob. Um, and I will turn these uh, chicken scratch notes into electronic version for you, Clark, uh, later later today so that you can read them um, a little more closely. But you know, the general theme uh, with a DDoS attack uh, taking systems offline is uh, how, how does a uh, how does an organization respond? Um, separate from you know IT systems trying to think how to how to how to bring them back online and get them up and operational, it was more focused on what are the alternatives available to uh, GIS professionals. And some of the key things that came out of the discussion was uh, making sure that you had a plan B in place. That plan B ranged from having a single computer uh, set up uh, with with data locally on that machine. Um, and making sure that those participants come to the EOC, uh, that that maybe is even on a separate network from your original network. So it's kind of uh, uh, cut off from any internet access anyhow, so that it can operate in that environment on a daily basis. Um, another option was, especially in a DDoS attack, is usually 
that attack vector is usually attacking one system or one website at a time. And so uh, the thought process was that if you have, let's say, an, a portal site uh, on premise that you had a website that you could then have a secondary website to offload and move your website somewhere else so that that threat is not um, coming at that secondary system. And now you can, you can share that secondary link out to everybody else. Uh, those that are using ArcGIS Online and Cloud uh, for large part should be okay, except in a very, very massive DDoS attack, mainly because we know that uh, AWS is being used in the cloud and with all of the systems there, it can quickly scale up to meet any threat in DDoS, but it still is a possibility. So I think at that point, if it's really that bad, then you, you definitely wanna make sure you have that plan B local system available in your EOC. Uh, that pretty much summed it up. We talked a little bit about data as well and, and data access uh, as it relates to it and data protection, but, um, and trying to determine that. But largely that's, that's really what it came down to is have a plan B. And then also I think one of the participants mentioned, we really have to train uh, on this environment. We just can't just set up the system and have it sit there. Um, we need to train, we need to practice, go through your tabletops, uh, go through your uh, functional exercise, find out where your gaps in, are at, fill them in and train again until the real event happens. So that's in a nutshell. Like I say, I'll, I'll get these uh, written down and send over to you later in the day, Clark. Great. Thanks so much, Chris, Bob, and all the members of your, your breakout group. Uh, I think we can go back to the big screen now, uh, the panelist screen. So the next uh, uh, group is the, the SCADA group, uh, which uh, Jim Featherstone and uh, I think Rand, you were involved in that one. And so I don't know if you want to tee this up, uh, Jim. Um, no, the, the people I work with are, are much smarter than me, but um, I, I did want to uh, piggyback on something that Chris just said about uh, exercising it because it you know it was a, a quote that came out of the Boston bombing said that people don't necessarily rise to the occasion in a crisis they sink to the height of their training and preparedness yep yep well said so we, we the, our muscle you know the rubber band always goes back to its original shape and so you know but but if we stretch it it, it it'll, it'll never go back to when it came out of the box if we continually stretch it it'll be a little more elastic each time so you know with like the sets and reps make a big difference you know whether it's with ones and zeros or whether it's you know throwing a ladder or laying hose you know if you 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 have to develop that crisis muscle memory yeah so that being said um, I'm actually going to hand it off to Scott, who, um, you know, we, we had an interesting discussion. I learned a lot. I, 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 I learned the most. I, I guarantee I learned the most in our group. But uh, it's a very interesting discussion. Scott? Thanks, Jim. Um, yeah, to, to address the uh, first question, um, the obvious thing for a SCADA attack um, is that you know, I, I've never been to an MUA and not gone in and seen their system in a map up on the wall. They always have that. So it, they need to have a copy of their system, you know, kind of, you know, in a little golden box up on the cor corner shelf uh, in case something happens. And uh, most of them probably do it. And if not, you know, some some guy in the back corner that like installed every piece of the system over the last 60 years. Um, but it's that where GIS fits into that is the mapping of all that information and the institutional knowledge and not only them having it, but say the, the SCADA attack was a vector for a virus or something to come in and wipe the whole system at the MUA. Okay, what happens then? Well, hopefully the MUA has shared their system up to, uh, I don't know if it's a you know, county level or to the state you know, environmental agency or something like that, that has a copy of it. Um, I know for uh, New Jersey, the state Department of Environmental Protection 
keeps copies of all the water and wastewater systems statewide. Uh, and in that case, you know, everything gets wiped at the local agency, they can go back and at least have that data if they didn't have something already in hand. Uh, and that goes into the second question, which is the knowing what you should be backing up. Uh, so it's, this is part of the uh, planning process of knowing, okay, these are our most critical, absolute, fundamental data sets. We need to protect these as best we can. So how do we set up disaster recovery plan to manage this data in case something happens? So, okay, do you do auto increments every day to a cloud setup or you know, save it out to an external drive once a week and then have that drive you know, driven across town or something to a separate building? Uh, just things to think about and not only do that one time and then, yeah, tick that box, I'm done. Uh, it's keep revisiting that plan because it's always going to change what's important at the given time and the technology of how you handle all this data. Um, and as far as backups themselves, it's, uh, yeah, it gets into having the different methods of uh, data restoring. And that's you know, I somewhere behind my desk here. I've got a little you know, two, terabyte, two terabyte drive that's backing up my desktop every day, just in case. Um, I, I'm one of those people that have lost data to a drive failure. So I'm very sensitive about backing up. Uh, never want to lose that stuff. Um, I think that hits all the points. Oh, the uh, just get back to the first point uh, with the mapping of the infrastructure as far as the SCADA attack concerns. Um, not only uh, with like a water system, like, okay, the one agency might have their area of influence, but then there's the one next door and maybe the SCADA attack is on like their interconnect valve or something like that. So having those communications between the uh, adjacent agencies um, and I think that does it for us. Great, great. Rand, anything to add to uh, your, your session? I'll say one quick thing. Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure if Kirk was able to join us when we came back. Kirk has some really good ideas in his own experience. He was talking about it as it relates to uh, mitigation and those kind of things. And he was talking about um, uh, and I thought it was very important, as as Jim said, uh, I, I was learning stuff while while I was listening to these guys. Um, he's looking at, at at ways to potentially air gap his system from the cloud when it comes down to a server before it gets to to his uh, uh, systems, if you will. So looking at that kind of thing, how do you physically separate for at least some period of time your data from the cloud and, and where it may be manipulated or, or uh, uh, corrupted. So he has some good ideas we were talking about there as well. So I just want to make sure brought that out. So uh, thanks to Kirk for, for uh, sharing that with us. Great. Thanks. That was very good. And, and uh, one of the things that uh, we've touched on the unique uh, nature of SCADA, you know, as a attack vector, uh, we've been in places where, uh, and I think uh, uh, Peter mentioned this earlier, uh, We've been to places where all of the utilities, really all of the kind of you know um, um, functionality within a within SCADA systems, are privately held. They're in the private sector. They are businesses essentially. Uh, others who have exist even in the private sector because of a relationship, a funding relationship, with uh, the governmental entity, the public entity. And then there are places which the they're largely the public sector that you know establishes these these systems and it's just a patchwork. But to me, what's interesting is, you know, each of those systems and, and jurisdictions have their own kind of corporate ethos, I guess, uh, their own requirements by way of accountability, training, et cetera. Uh, when they're hybrids or when they're exclusively public sector, well, I, I think that there's probably an opportunity for a lot more, you know, uh, you know, a lot more options in terms of attempting to do the planning. But on the other hand, there's also a lot less 
time and money and, and uh, that sort of thing. So uh, as part of the mapping that, that Rand talks about, I think it's just so critical. I think those intersections and those uh, interrelationships uh, are a big piece of the puzzle, particularly when you're talking about what's susceptible to SCADA manipulation, which can be so, so devastating. So yeah, thank you, that was, that was terrific. So last group, Eileen, and, and Eileen had a challenge in her group because some interloper uh, came in and basically just polluted the conversation. Constantly name interrupting, constantly Oh, interrupting. for gosh sakes, yeah. So they did pretty well, well in, in spite of it all. Uh, we, so. You know, I don't, unfortunately, just to queue up our team, I don't have any great... Uh, uh, quotes or rubber band analogies like Jim Featherstone is always managing to come up with, but I did have Clark, Daniel, Peter, and Justin, along with uh, many other folks who uh, were put in our, our group. We had a little bit of an East-West thing going on in our group, but we also, I think after hearing the other presentations, I think you're all going to hear some common themes uh, that uh, we were all discussing, particularly about key data sets, mapping, uh, paper copies, things like that, uh, that it sounds like all the groups um, have talked about. I think, uh, Peter, um, is, is, it, is this your screen share that you brought up? Or Daniel, Daniel, I'm sorry. It's mine, that's yeah. okay. Please go ahead, Daniel, I'm so sorry. All right, um, so yeah, we, we were the by the letter group, I guess, uh, following all the three questions that were asked of our group here. And uh, you know, to address kind of the, the first question, we started out the conversation by saying, uh, I don't know, <laughs> as far as, you know, what's the aspect of GIS and this type of response? Um, really, GIS is the tertiary impact. You have an impact from the ransomware attack that then impacts other systems that are utilized by your jurisdiction or by your agency. So, you know, really kind of talking about it, uh, key points here, training and preparedness, you know, the response is out of your hands. IT is working heavily in trying to restore systems uh, to get you back up to speed, but you're going to want to be prepared for that, having a coup plan, off-site, uh, off-duty plans. Um, are you working with your neighboring jurisdictions like neighbors helping neighbors? So being able to have another jurisdiction help you out by maybe backing up your data and then exchange you back up their data so that you have kind of that, uh, the community is helping out the community there. Um, you know, understand the cascading impacts. If something does go wrong, does go down, how does that impact you and how does that impact your partners and others? Um, you know, if we go back to the traditional ICS methodology of GIS, GIS is fit underneath the unit, underneath planning, maybe a, a slightly different modification of that, but Overall, GIS is providing for situational awareness. So going back to the uh, methodology of, we're sharing information about what's happening out there. So, you know, uh, who's the holder of the data? What backups are available? Where are we at in the status of restoring systems from that particular incident? And what's allowed to be used and what's compromised based upon the status of the event and restoration? Um, identification of essential elements of information uh, for the event hazard. You know what it is going in to a degree. You know what your key data sets are based off of uh, planning that you've done previously. So being able to provide a, an adequate situation brief off of that information. Um, to address kind of question number two there, what are the key mitigations and workarounds? Um, figure out what your essential systems are. Now, what are the, the key systems that you utilize and how can you restore that, whether it's in a disconnected environment or a connected environment? So, um, you know, Justin talked a little bit about the inventory of data sets on their key critical apps and being able to restore that. Maybe you have an ARC Pro project that's on hand that you can just bring up and, you know, transition from having an online mapping application to I'm going to go on do a printout of a map and waste those trees like we were talking about. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, being able to, to take into account what are your key things that you're uh, working with and addressing and being able to put something together on the fly. Um, so the last question, this is really kind of where the bang for the buck is. 
identifying data that's core to your mission, making sure that you have a continuity plan in place and have it staged up regardless of what the scenario is. To do a very quick aside on this, uh, from a personal experience that I had this year, we had an ice storm that blew through in February that knocked out power. Well, when you're working remotely and you don't have power, what's gonna happen? And you know, being able for me to shelter in a totally separate location, drive a little bit to get there, but be able to have applications and apps up and running, they were already in ARC online, so it was, wasn't necessarily as big of an issue, but being able to literally take my workstation, move it to an alternate facility, that's what COOP is, right, to a degree. So being able to address that and account for that, regardless of kind of what the state is out there. Um, getting the data that you need to function, you know, have your data in multiple places that you can pull from. Um, you know, if it involves location, GIS needs to be a seat at the table. Um, being able to take a look at, you know, what are uh, the key applications that you're using in uh, the new environments. You now, all of us have been working remotely for quite a while and taking a look at what are your virtual EOC products that you're utilizing to provide and share information there and ensure that you know and understand what those requirements are to keep those up and running. Um, you know, taking a look at uh, reliance upon uh, static or infrastructure at your facility, whether it's ArcGIS server, um, confidence in the backups that you have, um, utilization potentially of ArcGIS online to shift some of the server load to the cloud, AWS, um, cataloging key critical data sets apps, et cetera. Um, also, when you're doing those sorts of things, being able to uh, list those out and have those on hand so that, you know, the side benefit here is if you have people coming from out of state, whether through EMAC or mutual aid, they actually have a running list of, hey, here's what our key apps are, here's where the key data sets are, and be able to hit the ground running. There's a side benefit to some of these mitigation actions that we're doing to help prepare for these types of events. Um, also, and, and I will admit this is not unique to GIS, but having a mindset for your partners and partner agencies with emergency management to ensure that they are prepared to provide at a moment's notice. You know, it's not just the GIS staff that face this issue. We have emergency support function partners at all levels that need to be prepared and ready to respond. And one kind of other side note here too, um, one of the big things that we've done here in Oregon has been the advancement of our emergency operations plan in the current revision cycle to actually have an identified cyber ESF uh, so that we actually have a focus on dealing with cyber regardless of what event it is. Being able to identify what the key partners are uh, for addressing cyber concerns and having almost a standard guide of operations. How are they gonna be interfacing with emergency operations centers, et cetera, to be able to address cyber related issues and concerns. So sorry, I, I went a little bit wordy there, but feel free Peter and Eileen to, and Justin to add any more to the list there. <laughs> oh, you did great, very comprehensive, thank you. Let's go back, let's go back to the full panel. Um, that was great, Daniel. Peter, anything to add? Um, I, I think uh, the only thing to add, and it's not even add, it's reiterate, um, and Chris jumped off, but I think training and preparedness is a key to, to all of these evolutions, right? Uh, I mean, if you get hit with them, you're basically a passenger until the uh, evolution is over and, and IT resolves the situation. Um, but if you're prepared and you're trained um, in the emergency management cycle, the mitigation is going to take care of itself, right? If you have that um, that continuity of business plan uh, in place that you know, okay, this is how I'm going to recover if, if this hits or this hits, um, I, I think that's that's where the, the bang for the buck is, to be honest. Yeah. Um, Justin, anything else? on this topic? 
No, I mean, I think um, I think it's been covered pretty broadly. I think when I think of the three different scenarios that were discussed during this exercise, to me, ransomware scares me the most. Uh, I think emergency managers do a pretty good job a lot of times finding alternative communications means to get you know, to and from or get the data to them. But if we, if we can't get access to the data, we may never get it again. That, that could really present a lot of problems. Yeah, yeah, good point. Excellent point. Well, these have been great. I really appreciate this. I mean, I, you know, in, in our world at the Center for Homeland Defense and Security, it is exactly this kind of uh, opportunity uh, that, you know, we think should be happening not once a year or whenever there's some uh, kind of idle time, but all the time. Uh, not necessarily the big sort of uh, round tables, but you know, the right people around the table, multidisciplinary, public and private sector, running through scenarios, uh, asking you know, the question about you know, what are our gaps, what are our needs, knitting together the, proce the process of making the map. Uh, and, and I'm thinking now of a lot of different kinds of maps, but uh, the, the ones that tell you where things are connected, where if one thing goes down, there will be, you know, that those single points of failure, there's going to be cascading effects. All those things uh, point to what needs to be, uh, you know, fixed, as it were. And it's a long, slow evolutionary process. But think about doing this kind of thing you know, again, maybe not with the big numbers, but but uh, with a, a maybe on a focused set of, of uh, topics and objectives regularly. Um, I, I, can you imagine where we would be if if that ethos were to obtain, uh, and and not just in one discipline, but in all the disciplines that are connected? So again, that's kind of why the Center for Homeland Defense Security was created in the first place. And ultimately, what we want to to see happen is that these insights. Uh, get in front of decision makers, and some of you are those decision makers, or know those decision makers, and work directly with them. Uh, I'm going to just close this out uh, with uh, turning to my subject matter expert team. Uh, you're all subject matter experts, so it's the CHDS subject matter experts, for kind of their headlines or closing thoughts, uh, and uh, so I'll start with Bob. Hey, thanks, Clark, and I appreciate all the all the folks that participated today. I was very impressed at the quality of the discussion and the actual in-depth uh, thought that has been given to this particular topic on the part of the panelists, uh, both in plenary and in the breakout sessions. Uh, smart, folk like, smart folks like you that are taking this kind of potential danger into account in advance is a key to success. If we don't have that, uh, we're, we're, we're dead in the water. Uh, lot, lots of uh, everyday growing threats uh, in this environment that get more complex, that get more tricky, that get more sinister. We have to try to do our best to anticipate that. And now to take to heart some of the mitigations, importantly, that you all spoke to regarding the data um, and the system's uh, continued functionality in some other form than their, their normal state is a good one. And I also brought up in, in our group about Data mining is great to understand the functionality that you provide and where it reaches into and, and the dependencies and interdependencies, but that mapping also might be subject to access to the very adversaries we're hoping to defeat. So protecting that GIS capability, the data and the systems that you all represent is equally important to the mitigation piece for the functionality uh, because I, I know the Russians and the Chinese would love to grab all of your work and advance their cause. So protecting that while we're continuing to focus on the mitigation piece is critically important. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to participate today. Thank you, Bob. Jim, and I'm hoping we hear some uh, analogies, metaphors, and some poetic observations. Well, first, I want to say uh, thank, thanks for allowing me to be a part of this today. I, I, uh, I always learn a tremendous amount. Hopefully, I'm learning a lot more than I'm actually contributing because um, I need it. Uh, and uh, you guys nailed it. You, I mean, it's, it's uh, about the, the talking, the chat around, the talking, you know, the, the collective, because uh, we're all in this together. Uh, some really good conversations today. Uh, uh, I was scribbling notes, and I, I do want to say, Peter Hanna, you were a game changer. You were catalytic in the city of Los Angeles embracing crisis management GIS. 
uh, not BSing you. I mean, seriously, I mean, you, you changed my mind and we went through a whole thing of uh, evolving the city. So uh, I think Rand said you were, you know, about you being an evangelist, um, definitely, you know, and, and I don't think you even knew it, but uh, you know, the, the little teeny village here by the sea um, became much more GIS literate and functional because of a speech you gave several years ago. So you know, kudos to you, kudos to, to NAPSIC. Um, it's great to be a part of this discussion today. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Eileen? Uh, well, Clark, next time I'm gonna have to pay you to ensure I don't follow Jim and Bob uh, because they are <laughs> both very hard acts to follow in, in summarizing our day. I think what I would add to their insights really uh, is the following. Um, Bob was right in saying, you know, that we have to keep up with these threats. They're growing, they're evolving. Uh, but fundamentally, this threat is no longer new. There is no excuse not to be on top of this, to not be having the foresight, to not uh, be planning and preparing. Planning and preparing those key concepts of emergency management have to be applied to this cyber world. And um, hearing the conversation today, uh, first, I do thank you for participating. I learned a lot from all of you, just as as Jim expressed, you are in a very impressive group. It's clear that you are uh, preparing and planning and working with your jurisdictions. But just like Jim complimented Peter about being uh, the advocate, we have to go out and advocate to all the jurisdictions that are not here because of the interconnectedness we all have. One of our jurisdictions goes down, every other jurisdiction is gonna be impacted one way or another. And we all have to be the preachers to bring more people to the table, to understand how we're all in this together. And that's the only way we can stay on top of this. I thank you all for your, your brilliance today, but also more importantly, for what you do every day um, in trying to keep all of us uh, safe. Uh, so thank you. And thank you, Clark. Thank you, Eileen. I think you did a fine job following uh, uh, both Bob and, and Jim. I think they now want to re recant uh, uh, their their uh, particular presentation. Well, uh, I don't have much more to say. I just have enjoyed the heck out of this, and and I always I like spending time with people that are so much smarter than I am. And of course, Featherstone will say, "Well, that's just about everybody, isn't it?" Uh, but in my experience with the 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 center, uh, what we did today was what we seek to do in our programs, which is bring together dedicated. Uh, folks with a great deal of passion and expertise and experience to work through really thorny problems. And we gave you about as thorny a set of problems as you can even imagine. But at the same time, I think we were uh, seeing and, uh, and hoping to see that uh, when, you, when you're able to address a, a big problem, one big problem, you're actually able to address many, many, many big problems. That, that kind of uh, rising tide lifts all boats uh, concept. And many of the things we talked about today may have focused on cyber attacks, but they had applicability in pretty much everything that uh, traumatizes our society and that we seek to return back to some state of, of normalcy. Uh, it was a real privilege for the center at the Naval Postgraduate School to uh, collaborate with both NAPSIG for the Inspire Summit. Uh, this is a partnership that I, I think uh, we value very highly and that is going to continue as we go forward. Uh, the center has a number of programs. I commend to you uh, the website uh, that we have put on the link to this event. Uh, take a look at uh, the Center for Homeland Defense and Security. We have a fully accredited master's uh, program uh, that a number of uh, the folks that you probably know, uh, Eileen, uh, for example, is, is a master's grad. Uh, it's a superb program. Uh, uh, we have an executive leaders program. We have this program, executive education, which includes our seminar series. Uh, and this is all uh, free. This is all for you. Uh, we're funded uh, by Congress through the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Uh, so there is no cost to, to avail yourself of these programs. And, uh, and we seek to build this, this network. Uh, Want to thank my colleagues. Chris had to jump off. Rand, uh, Justin, always a pleasure and a privilege to spend time with you and hear your observations. Uh, and uh, for my part, 
uh, I think we, uh, we got a lot accomplished today and uh, hearing from you and knowing you and now counting many of you as my new best friends, uh, I wanna sh say to you all that uh, the, the people that need you, the people that depend upon your skills and your expertise, wherever it is, jurisdictionally or in your own communities, they are in very, very good hands. Uh, and I commend and applaud you for that. And uh, thanks everyone. Uh, we'll, we'll see you down the road and keep up the good work.